before we do the one, two, three. All right. Ready? Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Welcome, Welcome to, to Muay, Muay Thai, Thai Bones. Bones. Um, we're just pulling out of the hotel. Sylvie fought last night. I, I love how real this podcast is. Um, as you can see, for those of you who are on YouTube, Sylvie's got a few stitches that she took last night. I just fucking love that you have fight injuries and you're hopping on the next morning. That way. I go to the right. Yeah. Um, the next morning to do the Muay Thai Bones podcast. Yeah. As we do. As we do. And um, I kind of miss the Muay Thai Bones podcast. We were traveling. Uh, we had different a different fight pattern. Uh, and we usually do these coming back from um, Chiang Mai. Um, but this time we fought in the Hua Hin. So mm -hmm. we kind of, um, I'm happy to jump back into Muay Thai Bones. Yeah. But yeah. we have lots of good topics because it's... Totally. Nice what happens it. is... Um, we talk. <laughs> we we talk, but because it's been a little bit of time between uh, Muay Thai Bones, we uh, um, gather topics that are interesting to us over the over the um, weeks. So we have a lot of good topics this time. This might be a very good one. Yeah, Kevin um, and I like we literally are just so going about our lives, <laughs> talking about Muay Thai the way that we do, and uh, you have to go that way. Okay. And. Um, we're like, oh, that would make an interesting Muay Thai Bones topic. Like, note it. Write it down. Kind of. Yeah. I guess you could go left and do a U-turn if this is a little bit intense. Okay. Um, so the first the first topic we're going to start with is kind of an interesting one. Um, it's a little bit technical. We, we always do one technical thing, but I don't know. This is a very interesting thing. This is about fight IQ. You hear this a lot in Thailand. Uh, that certain fighters are high IQ and other fighters are low IQ. You get criticism from um, coaches um, for not having IQ or from like uh, people in the Muay Thai community, right? And in Thai, they actually just say IQ. So it's either you have IQ or no IQ. Yeah, <laughs> there's, yeah, no, like, yeah, there's not like pretty IQ. good IQ. There's like... <laughs> There's genius level and no <laughs> IQ. Um, but this is actually something that I wanted to, um, that I've been thinking about for a while. And this is how to get instant IQ. Like, we like to think of IQ as this kind of like computational brilliance that, where you see everything. And that does actually exist in Muay Thai. We, Sylvia and I talk about it. We talk about like growing eyes, being able to see in the dark. You specifically can see this when uh, Westerners fight high-level uh, ties. The ties are kind of like in the matrix. They're like operating in a totally different zone of awareness. But this is actually about, for me, it's about, um, there's like a, a hack. I know you don't like hacks. But there's like a hack into getting instant IQ. And that is teeping. Yeah. It, no matter what your style is, even if you're like, if you're a brawler, if you're a Dern Muay Cow fighter, a knee fighter, a clinch fighter, a, a combination fighter, like a Dutch style one, two, three low kick uh, fighter, you can add IQ just by adding a T. It's like a level up. It, well, I don't know. Why do you say a level up? That's, I, I don't, I, it's not like you're better. You're able to... It allows you to control timing. It's like you all yes. of a sudden have a pause button, whereas you had yes. a pause button before. It's like playing a video game and you could hit pause at any time. And this is kind of the interesting thing. It's not like you're actually increasing your intelligence, but you're increasing your intelligence's ability to process information and control the fight pattern, right? So... Well, I don't know. Can you maybe help me on this a little bit? What am I thinking about? Like, Well, to me, the thing that's interesting about the teep is that it was like day one in Master K's basement emphasized. He calls it the electric fence of Muay Thai. Right. And he's like, the teep is the number one thing. And by calling it an electric fence, he thinks of it defensively. But we very, very slowly, gradually started to understand the teep as offense and defense. And it, there's literally no style that it doesn't 
improve by giving you the ability to um, control the timing of what's happening between you and your opponent. So what we're talking about is tempo, maybe, in a tempo setting. And a lot of times what's happening in a fight is there's two beats or patterns of each opponent. Sometimes they're similar, sometimes they're dissimilar. But basically the fight is over um, whose pattern, whose beat is the fight going to be on. And if you get caught in your opponent's pattern, especially in Thailand, you're going to lose. Yeah. Because they're not adding up damage points on a calculator. Yeah. So being able to establish your pattern or interrupt, maybe more importantly, interrupt your opponent's pattern comes from teeping. Yeah. One of the interesting things that happened when Diesel Noy came to Petron Rung, and he's at Petron Rung now through January, he's training the Thai boys, the stadium fighters, and also mentoring um, everybody and people who help us on Patreon made this happen. You know, we're, we're basically paying him to come to the gym. Uh, it's part of a... Um, Legends and Residence. Legends and Residence and project. And Royal Thai Residence is sponsoring his room, which is very nice. Right, so we're paying paying him to be there out of patron, and Royal Thai Residence, we got a local hotel uh, to sponsor his room. So, Diesel Noy is known as like the most v- vicious knee fighter uh, in the sport, in the history of the sport. But what he brought, he brought many things to the gym, but one of the most interesting things he brought to the TIE fighters was the teeth. He's like insistent that you have to teeth. Yes. And he, at the stadium, you will hear poop. From <laughs> him. Diesel is like, you're like, I know that sound. <laughs> I know that. So what we'll get, I mean, as a fighter, so you've started to incorporate your teeth too, and you have a nice little shotgun teeth that, that came from Pinu. Where there's like long, you see these long, beautiful teeps, but there's also like a stubby, like blasty teep that can be done from short range. Yeah, Karahat likes a long teep. Uh, Yod Kun Pan and Pinu like a short teep. Diesel Noi wants the short teep because I'm a Dern fighter, so I'm coming forward. It would have changed the fight last night, honestly, a teep. Oh, 100%. Matter of fact, there was a really interesting part in that fight, not to get into it too much, where I told you to teep after the third round, I believe maybe the fourth round, you teeped once, she was bothered by it, and she then teeped you two times into the, towards the face, basically to get you to stop teeping. Like, oh, you're gonna teep me, I'm gonna teep you back. And this is actually one of the secrets of teeping is if someone's teeping you, teep the teeper. Teep the teeper. A lot of times the teeper does not like being teeped. They wanna be the one setting the, the tone. Yeah. It's like a it's like a boxer with a really good jab. Like you jab them back, you change the like rhythm of what's happening. So I don't know, we've outlined the general idea, but I don't know, I would like to hear a little bit about how the teep relates to overall the overall impression of IQ. Like the judge's impression. Well, the the opposite of IQ in Thailand is Mua, and Mua is this like, just what we would call a brawler or just unskilled, like something that's just kind of like- indistinct, It's right? indistinct, it's like, it looks like you're just throwing everything. Muddled. It's, it's like how when kids play soccer, it's glob ball, they all just go around where the ball is. There's no like, let's pass to them, there's no mm. formation. Um, so there's IQ and there's Mua, and I think that when you add the teep, Mm. Even if it's not true, although I think adding the teep makes it true pretty instantaneously, you are creating the impression and visual distinction of mm. I am choosing when my strikes come out, I am choosing where you are, mm. I am controlling the timing and the spacing in the ring. Um, in the West, we like to say like ring control, and it's basically just like cutting off or yeah, like yeah. who's more near the center at any given time. Mm. Ring control in Thailand is opponent control. Mm. And it's like, someone can be running away from you. We talk about this a lot on this podcast, but someone can be running away from you and it can look like you're chasing after them, but you can do one small thing that makes it look like they are fucking barely staying away from you. Yeah. 
And it's it's an interpretation of literally the exact same movements. Well, and I, a teep changes interpretation. Yeah, I mean, you can just picture right now in your mind's eye, picture like the most brawly kind of like head forward um, windmilling fighter. Mm -hmm. That's okay, baby, let's stop with that. Yeah. Uh, the most brawly windmilling fighter, right? Picture this kind of like swimming. fist swimming forward. Now picture the same fighter going teep, teep, windmill, 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 teep, yeah. teep. Yeah. Like just the contrast between the windmilling fists and the uh, teeping yeah. creates like, oh, this weird sense like, oh, and you're purposefully windmilling. Yeah. Like, now I windmill. Now I teep. Yeah. It's a really, it's like instantaneous IQ. Yeah. Like, it, it's kind of crazy. Like, you you hear, like, if you're around Muay Thai uh, instructors and stuff, you hear how important the teep is. Yeah. Like, it's much loved and everything. But I think people, I know we didn't really understand fully how it changes the impression of your fighting style instantaneously. Yeah. It's like a court jester. They're an idiot. Like, that's mm. what they do. But when they start juggling, you're like, well, that's a skill. <laughs> like, well, it's entertaining, yeah, right? Yeah, but and, it's, it's... And teeping is like juggling in like a certain way yeah. because you're basically deciding where the opponent's going to stand. Yeah. And one of the interesting things about a teep is that it actually has almost no points in Thailand unless you really kind of rocket somebody and move them off their position. There's points in Thailand which are kind of like victorious moments over position or moments of dominance, but the teep is a kind of cumulative aesthetic effect. It's like it's not points. Yeah. It's some other thing. Yeah. So. An important aspect of the teep is that if you're being teeped, you can't be upset by it. Yes. There's no points being scored against you, yeah. right? Until you start showing that there are points being scored against you. It's the yeah. other side of it, right? Hmm. It's like a it's like a boxer's jab where they're just kind of like popping it in your yeah, face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're yeah. not annoyed by that and you're just kind no. of fucking tyson your way into it, it's like that jab means nothing. There's yeah, no point. There's no point on But that, if you're yeah. going like this, which Alex does late in his fights, and they're just like barely, they're barely touching someone, and the person is like stopping, and like, I can't come forward, mm. I can't get past this. It's like this um, invisible net or something, mm. and you're like, well, that's clearly When you're, uh, for uh, people on the podcast, when you're doing this with your hand, you're just like um, tapping somebody, pawing, and, pawing somebody yeah. in the face repeatedly. Yeah. Um, there's another dimension about teeping. Well, you were just talking about performance. There's another dimension about teeping that we didn't quite really understand. A couple of misconceptions. One, you're a short limbed fighter, right? So we kind of thought the teep was not for you. Yeah. Why are you laughing? <laughs> not only short limbed, I'm just short everywhere. <laughs> okay. But you understand the point about do, limbs, yeah. right? I'm just people, laughing. I didn't people, interrupt you. Yeah, 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 but people think, people think, well, you're laughing at me. No, I'm laughing because you said only my limbs are short. Yeah, but the, in long limb, okay, we'll switch it's it up. It's considered a long limbed. Long limbed uh, fighters favor the teep. Yeah, you see right. a tall fighter and you're like, they're going to fight long yeah, teep. It, yeah. But they don't have to be tall, it's just the length of the limbs get exaggerated. Yeah by the teeping technique. Like, it suits it well. Like when, when um, like Kiro, uh, this really long-limbed fighter, uh, um, female fighter at Petron Rung, um, who Diesel Moy is kind of helping, we're like, God, if that, if she was teeping, that would be a fucking nightmare. Yes. Because. Her teep is so strong too. <laughs> totally. But this is a misconception we had. We were like, ah, short fighter, small fighter, why would I be teeping? It is, it is important. It might even be more important for a small fighter because you need to be able to... Uh, where am I going, actually? Straight. Okay. Well, you need to be able to score control of the space points um, in that way. Mm. 
you cannot just kind of trying to control the space with your arms. Yeah. Right? One second. And the other dimension that we didn't understand was you're like, you're a darn fighter, meaning you're a fighter that likes to persistent hunt your opponents, track them down, wear them out. You're basically trying to like, corner them to the rope, grab them, pull them off the rope, abuse them with knees in the lock. And I'm like, why would you teep? One of the more interesting things about the teep when you're chasing somebody is that if you teep them while you're chasing them, it looks more like they're running from you. And like or, you're knocking them back. Or you're, yeah. you're telling them where to run. Yeah. There's an aspect of, of, um, of Thai scoring, Thai aesthetics in, in Thailand, um, where an opponent can fade away and run from you and make it look like you're chasing them. Mm -hmm. So one of the big kind of aesthetic um, warfares that go on is like, do you look like you're chasing or does it look like she's running? Yeah. Right? And it's really a matter of performance. Like, almost the same movements can be running or chasing. Yeah. Right? It can be interpreted that way. The teep, when you're tracking somebody down, teeping them kind of helps you win the kind of um, rhetorical argument that you are, that she's running from you. Yeah, like it's a weird kind of illusion that you create. Who's doing what, yeah. Right? Not, that wasn't very interesting to you. No, I felt like we um, said that before, like, you know, oh, already. But okay. That's fine. You okay. clarified on more angles. Uh, any more on IQ? Uh, it was we something like to... that Diesel and I have been actually yelling at me about at the gym is about my teep. And it's actually that, like, when I'm, when I'm hitting with short-range weapons, I then teep, and then the person's too far away, and I have to close that distance again. And the problem is not actually the the teep throwing someone back. The problem is that I don't then follow. Mm. So if you're talking about like, does this look like this person's running from me or does mm. it look like I'm chasing this person? If you're not following in tempo with your teeps, if you're like teep and they go and then you uh, run after them, it's like yeah. you're not creating the impression that you're trying to create. So in the same way that juggling is all about timing and like- Which uh, way do I go here, go up on the ramp. On the right, okay. It's all about timing and um, smoothness, mm. like, like. Yeah, so if you, if you teep someone back and you immediately eat that space, you're showing that you, that you own this, yes. this territory. Yeah. It's like these battles um, for uh, no man's land between two fighters that often determine what a fight looks like. Yeah. It's a, there's something almost nothing more beautiful than a great teep and then a walk-in after it. Yeah. But in the, in the same way that the teep has to look like control by the proximity that you're keeping, it's the same thing with a dern. Like, if you're, if you're following after someone, like, you're really pressuring someone, but you're just six inches too far away, mm. it looks like you can't catch them rather yeah. than that you're, like, they can't breathe. Yeah. Um, another, another aspect of this that's kind of interesting is, um, oh man, I just dropped my, look at how beautiful that mountain is, baby. <laughs> We've never really been on this road at this hour. This is like 1230 or so. It looks it's like a tooth really sticking beautiful. out of the yeah, ground. It's, it's like just a jagged like mountain tooth. Came out of nothing. Oh, it's very beautiful in a beautiful blue sky with clouds. We're coming back from Pua Hin. I don't think we said that. So we're um, like on the opposite end of the coast from Pattaya. Right yeah, so uh, the drive up, just a little thing was drive up as we drive up to Bangkok around the kind of like bay. Well, I don't know what we, it's we technically like called. <laughs> That's a graphic a golf. A a golf. golf. Uh, and then come on the other side, which is Pattaya. Um, so, oh man, what was I going to say? Oh, two things. One is I kind of disagreed with D Diesel Noy about him not liking your teep after close range punches. Not because he's not right, because he is ultimately right. But there's an aspect of the teep that's super interesting, and then not to go too much into your own style, but one of the 
habits that you had developed. And a lot of people develop this on the bag and they develop it in pads, which is they throw their combination strike or whatever series of attacks are and then they hop out. And a lot of people, Sylvie has a technique vlog on this, like you don't wanna train hopping out on the bag and you also don't wanna train it in pads. And so Sylvia developed a kind of like habit of attacking and then hopping out of range, which was a problem because she's a Dern fighter, which means she wants to continually stay close, pressure opponent, take their breath away. And so this hop out was a kind of like um, uh, protection through distance. Like you hop out of range. There are some fighters that hop around a lot and this is a totally legitimate thing to do, but for what Sylvie needed to be, hopping out was a problem. One of the interesting things about introducing the way you just, I, I think you instinctively introduced it, I don't think it was a plan of yours, introducing the teep after combinations on the pads or something. Was this on pad work? I don't know where it came from. Yeah. No, I diesel mean, no diesel night on pad, pad work. work. Yeah. Is that what you're actually doing is you're creating that break where there, there's tension that you're in range and you're, you just threw something and now you can be countered, right? And the instinct can be to hop back to safety. Introducing the teep there, anticipating a counter, calling a brief timeout psychologically, I think is a step for, in the right direction. I agree with what you said, like, yeah, then follow the teep, complete the whole performance. But I think Diesel Noy wasn't quite perceiving your own, like, you can't always go from habits to ideal actions. You have to find, like, compromises. And I think in a way you, you were using the teep instinctively to create a compromise of being able to call a timeout where you're defensively okay for a moment and then you gather yourself. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same thing um, as your criticism of my shove off in the clinch. It's mm. used to take a break, it's used to get air, but then you have to follow. Like yeah. you, you come up and you gasp for air and then you go. Yeah. Um, but yes, I yeah. think that with that teep, because in Muay Thai there are actually so many ways to counter when you're being struck, you can block, you can dodge, you can teep, you can off balance. Like everyone thinks it's just like block, punch, block, punch, but a teep, when someone is on one leg, if it's really well timed, like all of this stuff, in the same way that we're talking initially about this being a point of IQ, mm. is because teeps are all about timing, they're not about power, mm. um, you can make it look like you're using a lot of power just with timing. But if you can, like, while your opponent is trying to strike, you teep them and they kind of, like, you know, get gutted. Yeah, they, or that little thing. Or whatever. I, I, I mean, I know exactly what Diesel Noy was saying but there's this thing where you're like it's not really a awful idea or habit to be to be teeping after strike because very often especially against female tie fighters a kick's coming back yeah it's like jabbing on your way out of something yeah like, yeah um and then the maybe the last thing how how far are we going oh we've done pretty good on teep um the way that i envision you teeping but really anyone teeping is that the teep, I think Silipatai was kind of like this. Oh my God. He's in the library. It doesn't even matter what you say, his teep is like everything. It's so beautiful. <laughs> but yeah, but there is this feeling like if you, one of the things about the teep is you kind of have to commit to it. Like, I feel like, I mean, you don't have to, but if you want to use it to its full effect, you want to create a kind of like um, drum beat of, Teep, 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 teep. Like you create this like metronome of what you're doing. And then your fight style grows out around it in yeah. counterpoint to it. So you can still fight exactly the way you want to, but try to create this like fucking like little punctuation, punctuation, but that that is readable by judges. Like, I see what you're doing. Mm. Like, she's teeping. I don't know, it's a very, I think if you get really skilled and committed at the teep, it's almost like, 
it becomes almost impossible to fight in where you get this in the extreme examples of like how fucking some art against that poor guy yeah. who's just like I'm just gonna deep the hell out of you I think he was like a Moimat fighter or something and he just like deep 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 okay I'll put you on the ground deep like but I feel like that's an exaggerated version of what should be happening all the time on a lesser level yeah I don't know it's pretty exciting it's exciting to me like if people are like low IQ no IQ and like well how do I get IQ there literally is a way to get IQ like you don't have to get smarter (laughs) in a weird way you suddenly look smarter and then you I think your intelligence does grow because you give yourself more time to do things on your own beat yeah right yeah and then suddenly you look smarter it's like if you're having a conversation with somebody and they keep interrupting you and you're stressed and people are watching you and you can't get your words out you sound dumb yeah you look like an idiot you look like an idiot but if you are like pause button I turn off your mic and now I'm going to tell you what I think suddenly you have an IQ yeah like it's really an impression it's not actual that's what the interesting thing is it's not actually IQ it just gives the impression of IQ yeah in a weird way okay I think we were pretty good on that First session, first little segment. We're rolling. Rolling. So, maybe a week ago. Or um, so. Kevin made, Kevin has started coming back to the gym for for a very long time. Kevin has not really been coming to my training. Um, but now he's coming with me to training all the time, which is awesome. And he's seeing everything that's happening in the gym, like... Everything that gets packed into even an hour at the gym is just insane. But he's been making these observations um, in watching training, and he came up with these 10 rules for better pad work in Thailand. I should say that this has not come from the last couple weeks. This is something that out of seven years of being in Thailand, like uh, watching. No, but then you were watching it, and you were like, I'm going to write this list. Yeah, the, the watching it anew made me write the list, but these are things that I've noticed and thought of for many years yeah like, yeah um so it's a little bit of a like i don't know cliff's notes cheat sheet of things that you can try to add to your pad work um to make it more interesting valuable pro- progressive and this is specifically it is pad specific work in thailand. thailand yeah uh these are things that you can't necessarily do in the west well let's talk for a minute why why it's pad work in Thailand because some people in comments this was put up on Instagram they're like this is just pad work anywhere but actually pad work in Thailand is not the same as pad work anywhere you might be at a gym where there's really great pad work but there's something particular about pad work in Thailand that maybe made me want to write these rules okay well why don't you say what why is well you're the one who experiences pad work in Thailand but for one your pad man very likely is a very experienced fighter. Yes. So Westerners just don't have the the opportunities in their culture or in their careers to really rack up the number of fights, especially from a young age. So very often what, what's very special about um, pad work in Thailand is your pad man has fighterly instincts that were... Uh, grown from a young age. Yeah, and the degree to which they can improvise. Yeah. Um, from the fucking years of experience they have as a pad holder, as a fighter, um, as a trainer, like all of these different things just create a kind of versatility that mm. is not necessarily matched often outside of Thailand. Right. Uh, very, uh, it's not always the case, but very often the pad work in the West is derived of the experiences Westerners had of Thai pad work. Yeah, it's like imitate. It's like a kind of like copy or yeah. rendition of it. Um, and so these are some of the things that can bring out better pad work in Thailand. And we put it up as a kind of like meme of 10. So we're going to just kind of like run through it and just kind of... Um, Spider-Man selling blessings. Somebody in a Spider-Man costume is selling blessings. Oh my gosh. And he's shooting a web (laughs) filled with garlands. I wish you could get this on camera. (laughs) It's unbelievable. That's amazing. Um, Um, So 
Hmm. Silence. So the sorry, there's a guy over there that I think is like a Power Ranger or something. Ah. Um. So do you start with one. Okay. I'm going to let you lead this a little bit, so maybe. So, number one is chin down, and then, parenthetically, no, really down more. Like, over, over-emphasize how far down your chin is. Samson Hassan, who we just added um, to the Muay Thai library again, he has a session that you can already see. Yeah. And then uh, we have just filmed a new session with him. His chin down is so intense that he looks like deformed a little mm. bit he's like it like it forces his mouth open which you would not think is a good idea well he does this at times he does like, it at yeah, times yeah. but it's so far down and it's one of these things that like anything you do in training is gonna get kind of um distorted in a fight mm. so if you kick if you punch up like this in training when you start getting tired and stressed you'll be punching in the face if you practice punching in the face, when you get tired and stressed, you're going to be punching in the chest. Like, everything just kind of gets... It just sounded like you advocated punching up in training. What I'm saying is you exaggerate something. So if you mm. super tuck your chin in a fight, when it starts to float, it'll be still pretty tough. It'll still be down, right? Um, yeah. Um, or, like, you know, like, super straightening out your punch when you're stressed. It'll be more straight than if you only have it kind of straight to begin with, and then you start, like, looping... So, that's a really good point, that you train, you don't want to be like overly kind of controlling of yourself, but you kind of train things on, on the bag and then in shadow and on the pads with the understanding that fights are going to degrade your yeah. technique. So... If you're trying to get, like, for instance, your elbows close to your ribs, which is something you were trying to do with uh, training with Sagat, you want them really close to your ribs. Yeah. Chin down is something that I think a lot of Thai Padman will not tell you to do also, which is one reason why you got to take responsibility for it for yourself. You yeah, if you if you float your head, they will tell you to tuck your chin. But in the same way that, like, so in the West, we learn to have a guard like this 24-7. Mm. In Thailand, they hate that because it looks really tense. So mm. if you have your chin down when you're four feet away from someone, you look really tense. They want you to understand when your hands come up so you look relaxed, when your chin goes down as you're coming closer, this kind of thing. So I think I think you will be told to tuck your chin in Thailand, but not in the exaggerated, constant way that we're I, talking I totally about. disagree. Like, uh, watching pad work at Patron Rui and all over the... There might be a time where they'll tell you to put your chin down, but if someone is floating their chin on their strikes, there's no... Your chin should be down when you're kicking. Yeah, Kim. When you're kicking, you should... Kim, your Kim, at yeah. Kim Muay Thai Gym makes Kim, you Kim is a good hold idea. a little thing under yeah. your chin while you're blocking. Like, while you're, yeah. like, marching and blocking. And I would say that Kem's emphasis on the chin was really unusual for Thailand. Yeah. But he's a, he teaches good hands, and the part of this comes from Western boxing yeah. and keeping your chin down. Yeah. I'm saying, like, even floating your chin on kicks, you'll never be corrected on that. Your chin should be tucked, like, because of what you were talking about, that, de that degra degradation of your technique that's going to happen under stress and fatigue in a fight. Right? So... If, if you're floating your chin up, like a perfect example is like um, when you are kneeing, you're, you pop your chin up. Yep. Nobody tells you to put your chin down when you're kneeing. Mm. Like, but you should be told to put your chin down. But it's just not part of what the tie is looking at. Yep. They're looking at hip position, foot position, how powerful is your knee, the the structure of your root, right? Yeah. Your form. All these things, I think, can be improved by tucking your chin. Yeah, and there's also a, um, what is the word? Continuity mm. that I think people fail to understand and that, like, when you train even a discipline that's singular, like Muay Thai, mm. 
you train it kind of compartmentalized. So there's shadow boxing, there's pad work, there's bag work, there's condition, like it's everything's kind of like in these little segments. Mm. Uh, and I think that I've noticed for myself, like when I'm shadow boxing, chin tucked all mm. the fucking time because there's no pressure. Yeah. Then I go on the bag and I'm like feeling pretty good and my head is floating and I have no under, I don't realize it's happening because the bag's not hitting me. Um, and it well, just kind of has a it's... different body map. And then I go into pad work and my head's floating and Pinu's smacking me. And I'm like, why can't I keep my chin down in pad work? And it's like, cause you're not keeping it down in bag work. Mm. Um, well, why do you think you lose it on bag work a little bit? Cause you're focusing more on the power of your strikes or yeah I think that most people on the bag are focusing on power mm. and when you're throwing with power keeping your chin tucked unless you have already coupled my power comes from this yeah. feeling which I don't think a lot of people have yes. the understanding to create that coupling early in their um, training right because they don't have it themselves and I don't think that teachers tend to teach feeling mm. that much. Mm. Um, I think you're right on something there is that that's one of the reasons why chin down in pad work is important is you want to start creating the feeling that this is where your strikes come from. Yeah. And when your chin comes down, you start to connect up with the back, the muscles of your back. Yeah, you were saying technique. when you saw me, I was focusing on tucking my chin on the bag because that's where I have a big problem with it. You were like, that looks completely different. It, it changes different It changes the connectivity of your torso to your hips even. Yeah. It really changes everything. Yeah. Like, so this isn't, these, these rules are not like, you must do <laughs> this. These are just like, um, try this for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Like, Tuck your chin on all your pad work. See how it feels. Right? Yeah. Um, you, I'm going to turn the map on. Oh, on that's this. pretty smart. I'm a genius. All right. Um, so he's putting on, putting Google Maps on. We haven't done this trip so many times that we know exactly where to go, which um, when we're coming back from Chiang Mai, like autopilot all day. So we're having a little bit of a pause. Yeah, here we go. Make sure the sound's on. Not that one. The lower one? Yeah. Okay. Um, 8.6, turn right. Okay. So, the second but, one is to step on every single strike. Oh, this is a fucking hard one. This I, is a hard one, baby. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do this thing with so my hard. cross, which I just did a technique vlog on, but I took this from Nung, who's... Napapon, he was a um, boxer, and he just, he he brings his whole, he like rocks forward rather than the twisting on his cross. The importance of stepping on that is so huge. It's between disaster and perfection. And if, every time I'm doing it, Kevin's like, step, Sylvie, step, step. And I'm like, oh, I am stepping. It's one of those things where you're like, well, I'm you doing it. But you're not. You have to feel your head, your hand, and your foot are all together. Like, when one moves, they all move. The, yes. When your foot moves, your head moves. This when your hand thing. moves, your foot moves. Everyone like, has a thing yeah. that they don't like doing because it makes them uncomfortable, right? Mm. So, I'm a very shy person. Mm. If I were to, like, be talking in front of a group and they're like, talk louder, I'd be like, <laughs> I, I am talking. <laughs> this is uh, it's oh, like that very, you're like, very good <laughs> stepping, very good analogy stepping maybe. forward you're like I am stepping forward but you have to like again like tucking the chin like really emphasize but it's it. weird because you almost sound like you are stepping forward but not enough you're not stepping forward but I think if I'm you stepping. think you are but the weird thing is you can step forward a tiny, tiny bit, you can and step, it's enough. No, you can step forward not at all. You can stomp the foot right where it is, and it still works if you're, like, close enough already. 
yeah, but you got to lift the foot off the, the ground. The statement, step on every strike, that comes from Thailand Pinson Chai. So I, the rem- Thai Library. I remember. And he, if you're already close, like when he's throwing an elbow, the foot like stays, it comes up and goes down exactly where it is, but it's like But stomp. this is the important part. It comes up and then comes down. Yeah, it moves. Be- because the weight transfers back for a moment, a flash, that's how what creates the, the, the ability to step. The reason why not stepping is a problem is that you get heavy on the front foot and you lose the ability to create that little rhythmic shift from back to front, yes. back to front, yes. back to front. So that so when we're saying step on every single strike, and we do, Thailand Pits and Chai, who's at San Thai, will tell you every single strike, every elbow, every push, every teep, right? Everything. Everything. Yeah. Is you want to create that little tiny rock of back forward. And it doesn't matter how big of a step it is. No, it's just the weight transfer, really. Yeah. Um, did I lose you on that? Your no. interest on that? No. I feel like I've lost you. Um, Looks like you're on to another thing, baby. The thing about about stepping on every strike is that it forces you to use your feet, mm. which punching or striking or whatevering mm. with your feet That's... is a huge secret oh, that people man. don't understand. But you have to, like, if you're not moving your feet, it's just a way to force you to move your feet and fight with your feet. And that's a really interesting uh, component of this. I think one of the biggest errors or problems with uh, punching, with striking with your hands, is, and and somewhat kicking, is your consciousness goes into your hands. Yes. Like, into your fist. Like, if you had to picture consciousness as a fluid that flows to a location, when you're when you're throwing your fists, for many, many people, that fluid flows down your limbs, you can think chi, into the ends of your hands. Yep. And then you're directing this fluid towards the target. Whereas if you're stepping, if you're moving, if you're fighting with your feet, you want some of that fluid, some of that consciousness to be down almost as far from your hands as possible. Because that connects all parts of your body to the ends of your hands. Because that's the real water pressure. Is not like right yeah. at the end of the hose. It's totally. everything before it. Totally. In 500 meters, stay right. Stay right. So this is one of the kind of like unusual high level things that you can train in pad work that has nothing to do with how like how balanced your strikes are or whatever the pad man is calling for. Mm. This is something that you can do privately. Right? Right turn? Right. Keep right. Keep right. That you can do privately and your pad man can know nothing about it. Yeah, you don't have to. Just a little tiny. You don't have to be like, do this thing with me. (laughs) No, it's actually really cool and you could do it with any pad man. Yeah. Right? And you can do it on the bag and in shadow and everything. You should be, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's number two. Uh, three is go on your own beat, don't mirror. And I think that you have to explain what that is. Mm, why do I have to? Is it more something I think than you? It's something... You don't agree? No, it's something you see more than me. Because when you're mirroring, you don't know you're mirroring. Mm. Um, I think this is a very big um, danger of Padrock in Thailand. One is you want to be obedient to your pad man. So, and you probably come from pad work um, histories where your crew, your coach back in, at home, like calls combinations, like call, 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 call. It's like called strikes. And when you come to Thailand, it's not your culture. Pad man may not speak English. You want to be obedient. And pad Pad work is not always awesome in Thailand. Thailand. Pad men, if you, if there's no spark in it, can you could be the fifth, sixth guy they're holding for, and they're just gonna call, 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 call. It's very patterned, very boring. Yeah, yeah, and what you're learning there accidentally, and it's actually a terrible thing, is 
you're letting your opponent, because you're, you're practicing strikes and your pad man is standing in for your opponent, you're letting your opponent condition everything you do. Everything you're doing is waiting for the, your opponent to do tell something, to do. tell you what to do. And that often expresses itself as you're waiting for the opening. Like, where's the target? So you start waiting for the opponent to expose a weakness that you can then take advantage of. It produces a really submissive, mirroring, unconscious mirroring of the other person in front of you, yeah. which is a disaster in fights. As we were talking about earlier with the teep, you want to create your own beat. And so part of writing about this rule was even though you're really trying to be a good student and follow the calls of strikes, you want to insert your own tempo. And you can do that with, with Padmen by teeping. Yeah. Like, you can do the called strikes, but then throw in the teep. Right? In, in Thailand, if your padman is wearing a belly pad, you can throw a teep at any time. And I have never met a pad holder that's like, no, don't do that. Yeah. And another thing you can throw in is body shots. Yeah. Not only that, there's a very subtle thing, especially with Pinu, because he's really good at calling strikes in order to produce fatigue. So you kind of end up kind of chasing him. And it's a really good thing because he's able to produce a lot of fatigue in you. Unfortunately, it also produces this other element, which is you're always a puppet on the string. Like, he's pulling you into deeper water. As a fighter, you want to be the one who's setting the tempo. And I'm like, it's even better if you refuse the strike when it's being called sometimes. This is kind of high level pad work though. I wouldn't say this for beginners or anything, but you kind of like, I see some really good pad work where the pad man is not determining when the strike is thrown. He might call for it, but then the fighter will wait. Yeah, don't like, if your pad man is like holding for a kick, don't punch him in the face. The yes. thing is like, on, <coughs> on my time, I throw that kick. When yeah, I'm ready, yeah. I throw that kick. Yeah, you take a step, you maybe flash your guard, and then you throw the kick. Yeah. Right? Like, you create that little, you impose yourself on the rhythm, the shared rhythm between you. Yes. I feel like these are, this is a really subtle thing um, that accidentally gets trained in the wrong direction for very good reasons. Yeah, well it's, again, this is a body mapping kind of thing where you're like, I feel so good in shadow boxing, why don't I feel like that on the pads? Mm. And it's like, you're not even standing the same because of the pressure mm. and having someone in front of you and what size your pad man is. Like, I had this insane experience of, I usually play around sparring with Pernu, who's like 5'10", 70 kilos, and there's just shit I can't do because he's like so tall and long and has these movements. Oh, you're very small. Movements. Yeah. But then Chicken Man, also probably about 70 kilos, but short, like mm. kind of my height, all of a sudden I could do fucking all kinds of things that I can't do on Pinu. Right. And it just feels different to have that shape in front of me. Mm. And you wouldn't know that unless you do that. A lot of people have a pad holder, so they don't know that yeah. they have certain feelings being like imprinted and Which is imprinted. really kind of a sad thing because you might have some pretty nice skills that you've developed, but they all kind of get coded as failures. So you are you don't believe in them and you won't fight with them. Yeah, but it's also if you go into pad work and you're like, I'm so good on the pads, why am I not like this in fights? Is mm. because your opponent is not trying to make you feel that distance that you feel mm. in pad work. Like they are trying to make it so that you're uncomfortable, standing at the wrong spot, uh, off balancing you. Like you, pad men do that too. They hit you back, they like, you know, make it difficult for you. But unless you train, on my beat, mm. when I'm ready to go, I yeah. find the opening. Like if you're dancing with someone else leading all the time and yeah. then you have to lead the dance, you're like, where yeah. the fuck does my hand go? Very good analogy, <laughs> baby. It's in the wrong spot. Totally. That's a really good analogy that you went in pad work, you basically are following, you're not leading the dance. I, 
I have strong memories of watching like high level fighters in pad work and I'm shocked how much they do not let the pad man tell them when something's yeah. happening. Like it's almost like a pissing contest sometimes. Right? Yeah. So And pad men like it. What do you like, mean? To a degree. Like oh, if, when you if go if you're not being a dick, if you go off script and kind of like play <laughs> with the pad holder, it's like thank God I'm not doing the same it's less boring. Busy work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm curious about, maybe you can tell me about this a little bit, is like, clearly you get called, you get caught up mirroring P. New, and you have a lot of super respect for him, and you always want to please him as your trainer. What is the struggle? I don't know if it's a struggle. What is the tension, or what is involved in you trying to impose your own beat? when for so long you've followed his beat. Like he's very like stubborn in insisting on things. What are you asking me? Like why is I it just hard to do my own it. beat? No, what is it like to try to ex extricate yourself from following someone's beat who you have tremendous amount of respect for? I don't feel like going on my own beat is disrespectful to him. I think that I'm just so used to the dynamic that we have had for five years, which actually has changed a lot, um, that when it's like, okay, try this different thing, that's a different feeling that's like, you find your own timing, you pick your own beat, all this stuff, is I'm kind of like, it's like if you have a conversation with somebody and then they're like, now you pick a topic and you're like, I don't, yeah, I'm not used to Yeah, that's not how the conversation like, goes. Yeah, it's not how we talk. Totally. Um, it can be very like, uh, I guess pools are cool. Like, I don't but, you, <laughs> but you can see how troubling it is for fighting because in fighting you pick the topic. Yeah. Right? Like ideally, it doesn't mean you're hitting first or something. But you're the one who's trying to like lead the dance. Yeah. And pad work ideally is like as much like real life, real fighting or real dancing as, as possible, possible yeah. right? I think that's pretty good. But what number are we on? I think we're gonna only do five of these. Okay. So we don't go too deep into this topic. Um Well, okay, this one you like. When the pad man... Wait, no. We'll just go in order. But oh, really? Yes. Okay. Just go into order. Four is touch the pads and pad man insistent. Rolling. Rolling. Uh, so we, we had a camera failure or something. The battery turned off. So we're not sure how much we lost. Roll your uh, window up. What, babe? Roll your window up. Mm. Um, so we're just going to start over at... Number four. Number four, which is touching the pads or pad man insist insistently, continuously, and staying close. So something that we were talking about in, in previous sections are about this like body mapping and feeling mm. of um, proximity and kind of timing and all these different things. There's something that happens unconsciously with pad holding, which is that you're always at pad holding range. Mm. Your pad man will step into the range for your kick um, or you'll take a step back or a step forward to get into the perfect range to land this thundering kick on the pads or whatever and it's pad work is mainly for power and this kind of thing so that there's nothing nefarious about it except that you're always training something whether you're aware of training it or not mm. and the thing about pad holding range is that you tend to find yourself standing in that distance in fights also because that's where you're most comfortable that's where you've spent most time and so you're at your opponent's pad holding range. They're just going to tee off on you all the time. So I've done technique vlogs about cheating this by standing slightly too close. And so you're messing with their like body mapping. They're like, this is too close. I can't throw anything. Yeah, but you you're used them. to it. Yeah. Like, well, you can be used like to you've it. done altitude training. So if you're if you've trained staying too close, you can fire at that range rather than only being at pad holding range. But so if you change your ranges in pad holding to be that you're touching the pads all the time, and this is something that I need to do because I'm a sh small, shorter fighter, I want to be close all the time, um, that if you picture your pad holder with their pads up waiting for you to punch them, 
you can put your gloves on those pads so that you are constantly touching the pads and firing from there. And it's kind of this like, if your jab can reach, you know your cross can reach kind of thing. Um, that like, if your hands are touching, you know that every single weapon you have can reach mm. from this many steps or that many steps. But it's also like having antenna or like cat whiskers where you can feel where your pad man is moving. My favorite thing about it is that you force your pad man to move. They don't like standing there. So right. they'll take a step back and then you can kick. Or like you keep your hands there and they're gonna like freeze for a second because they're like, oh, what is this kind of thing? Like it's very natural. Um, and you get hit from that range too. But when they take a step back, you follow them. Yes. Right. You, you stay, stay on them. It's in, like you're sticky. You stay in contact. Yeah. I like the cat whiskers analogy because what you're really doing is you're providing more data for your body. Like your eyes are telling your body how far you are from somebody or where they are located in space. When you have your hands touching your opponent, you're, which way you go, right or straight, left? Straight. Right or left? Left. Left. Oh, okay. Um, when you have a tactile, which way you go, right or left? Left, I guess, left, to Bangkok. Guess, yeah. Can we turn the volume on the, the map? Left, yeah, it is. No. It's on. This looks right. Okay. Okay, but we need the volume on, yeah. on this baby. Like, we're going to take a momentary break and get our navigation set up. It's up. Okay. Um, when you have, when your body, you're giving your body a tactile feedback of visual information, it just gets more precise, um, more real. Your, your brain now has two inputs for where your opponent's going to be, right? Yes. And there's something about creating that feedback where, you're, I don't know, it's kind of like going 3D or something. But this something. was this crazy thing is how many years have I been saying, get closer, get closer, get closer, mm. get closer. <laughs> Saying it doesn't do shit. Like, mm. even telling yourself, get closer, doesn't do anything. Mm. Like, I've been telling myself this for, like, seven years. Right. And I keep trying to do it. Like, I, I keep... I know to crowd Pinu. I know to, like, kind of try to crowd in on my sparring partners and things like this. And then the other day when Ajahn Gimyu was like, put your hands on champ and then mm. wait for his kick and counter or whatever, it was like... I don't know, like everything changed and I didn't have to do anything to make such a huge change. I just put my hands there and could like, it's it like was like an instantaneous it, giant change. Almost you had a instinct, um, an instinct took over or knowledge took over in a weird yeah, way. I don't know, it's like if you're trying to learn to swim but you won't get in the pool and you're like, get in the pool, get in the pool, get in the pool. And then you just finally fucking throw someone in the pool and they like doggy paddle. Mm. Like you feel it. Yeah, you yeah. have this instinctual movement. How does Pinu respond when you put your hands on his on his mitts? He likes it. It's good. He throws elbows and stuff at me, but mm. he's not like, no, don't do that. And one of the more interesting things about um, standing close like that is you realize that you don't need as much distance for for stri strikes as you think you do. Yeah. Like uh, kicking, you can kick at short range as well. Yeah. Um, it's not just that you're limited, that you're that you're not actually limiting your strikes as much as you think you might. What happens to your punches, though, if you're putting your hands on somebody? Well, you're firing out of a longer position. Are those goats? Those are goats. That's pretty cute. <laughs> like a herd of goats on the side of the road. I Why mean, is it a longer position? You're touching Because your you're like opponent. this, so you're going to be punching with your arms already kind of out a little bit. So you can still punch while touching the pads? I'm yeah, like, Gimyu has me doing that all the time, actually, with an uppercut. So um, both hands aren't... I mean, it seems unclear what we're saying. Both hands aren't on the pads. At least one hand. At least I'm, one, but you can have two if, uh, if the pad man is kind of squared up and close enough. Mm. But play with it. Like, yeah. find what you can do, what you like, what you don't like. Like, if Samson were going to be touching the pads, he'd be touching it with the backs of his hand, like, like full max guard with his hands on his forehead, pressing into it, like his pulse, because yeah. that's his version. Like, find your 
version of how close you want to be. And if you're touching pad, hands on pads, stepping on every strike is going to be even more difficult because you're going to feel like you're already close enough. Yeah. But you still need to pick your foot up and put it down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, that's pretty good. What's number five? No, I have to start again. I didn't know we were doing five. Uh, number five is teep. Teep, teep, teep. Don't wait for it to be called. Okay. So we talked about teeping as the instant IQ. Right. And how if your pad man wears a belly pad, you can really teep at any time. And you can teep the legs lightly, things like this. Like, you don't have to wait for a teep to be called. It can be like a filler to create your own distance and timing and things like that. Uh, this... This is also the way to invite your padman into real fight responses because they're experiencing rhythms that are not their own. Mm. And so you're calling up more of their fighterly reality, mm. right? Like you actually make it more enjoyable. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We might have already covered much of teeping. Yeah. Um, it's just really good to mix it up into your pad work. And I don't know. It's also something, sometimes you will get stuck in Thailand with a pad man who's boring as shit, who like holds the same patterns over and over again, who's checked out, who's like mm. basically make the frong tired, they're drunk, like whatever the thing is. Like you can get all kinds of shitty pad work in Thailand. It's not all amazing. If you start teeping that guy, you wake up his ex-fighter thing and it becomes a whole different totally. thing. Totally. And suddenly, it's fun for both suddenly of you. Suddenly, it's fun for everybody. Fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if you want to, uh, if you're interested in this, you haven't, you can go to, haven't seen the, uh, the full 10 list. It's on, there'll be a link in the description, hopefully. Um, it's on mine, Sylvie's Instagram. Um, maybe in the next Muay Thai Bones, we'll go for the last five. Um, but... I think that was a pretty good dive into pad work and things that can improve your pad work. Right? Okay, rolling. Rolling. Next subject. This is a. Uh, we're switching this up. This is kind of interesting to me. Um, the Awakenings website, uh, run by uh, Rue Mitchell, finally closed. Now, for those that don't know what Awakenings was. Uh, it was a website devoted to not only the celebration of female fighters uh, of Muay Thai, but also MMA. They kind of tried to cover both uh, sports, in, and they created female fighter profiles, like, pretty prodigiously. Yeah, you could look anyone up, really. Yeah, I mean, they did a very good job of data collection, which is a fucking pain in the ass. <laughs> oh, my God updating records they tried really hard to update sylvie's record I which was, was pain in the ass changing so, so often, often. Yeah. but this is really about i don't know for me it's about when we came to thailand when we moved here i think is right around when awakening started right i think that's right yeah so the closing of awakenings for me signified a kind of end of an era yeah. which was the era when we came to Thailand and Sylvie started Eight Limbs Us. And I I don't know. I think Rue has a feeling like the Muay Thai community let him down or the female community didn't get behind him enough. He put a lot into the website. And I think it mirrors in a weird way what we kind of experienced, which we we, we came, came here thinking, Sylvie's gonna blog the hell out of her experience. We're gonna start this website we crowd front of the website. So we put up lots and lots of articles and we really kind of thought that other female fighters would just come and do the same. Like yeah. they're, that in five years there would be like five or 10 female fighter blogs. And there, there were, there was like a little wave of women starting blogs, but then they stopped writing or disappeared or kind of like faded out. Well, we actually helped women start some of those yeah. blogs. Like we were actually trying to seed the idea that blogging was um, 
an important way for female fighters to show their voice and their experiences in Thailand. And we're talking about female fighters in Thailand, right? Yeah. And I, I guess what I wanted to talk about a little bit is like, Rue came to Awakenings, this website and this effort with very idealistic kind of expectations and hopes. And we did as well. Like, we thought that what we, Sylvie was doing was just going to, like, open the door for many, many uh, women doing this. If not blogging on a website, vlogging, like, vlogging their experiences. Oh, wait, I have to make a lane change here. This is very slow. Bus ahead of us. Um, and it just didn't shake out that way, which is super interesting to me. Like... It didn't go the way anyone expected it to go. And as you say, there were blogs that started but then died out. Because it's fucking hard. Well, that's the first thing is this shit is hard. Like, I, really, Emma's is the only female fighter blog that continued, that yep. started in, the, in this era and continued that we know of. Maybe yep. there's one or two others out there. Um, and I'm like, so one is, I think, the amount of effort it takes to blog, or even vlog, is a lot. Yeah. Like, even pointing a camera to your at yourself once a week, tw twice a month, yeah, it takes a lot out of you, right? Not only Baby. is it exhausting because you don't want the exposure, you don't want the work, you don't want to have to do something when you're so tired from everything that's going on but there's also this like stimulus overload that comes from training in Thailand mm. which is like so much is happening all the time that when you first come it's all very new and exotic and you're like I have endless things to talk about mm. but then you get into your pattern and you're like I don't know what to talk about like mm. it's not interesting to you anymore because it's your daily routine. And you're grinding. And you you're grinding hard. Like, the training is very hard in Thailand. Like, I, I went through a period that, um, I don't know, it was maybe two or three years ago where I was getting a lot of messages from beginners asking me questions about coming to Thailand or, or what they should know or do or whatever. And I was like, my boat is so far from that shore right now, I don't remember. Like, I don't know what to advise you mm. because I'm so far from it. But that was one of the reasons that the forum became amazing was that people who are on all different um, parts of that process can all talk together. And that's what we wanted from women blogging is, like, but everyone even, has different experiences. But even the forum has been disappointing. Like... Yes, we there is a community there that is like sharing information, but it's still a small community. Mm -hmm. We pictured the forum to be like this open digital space where people can be like not uh, intimidated, not intimidated, but also not like the fucking Facebook world we live in is so like me versus you. Uh, shit talking or vague booking like the the tone of Muay Thai conversation is I, it's not enjoyable no it can be very nasty we wanted to create a different kind of digital space and we're like if we created it people are going to flood into it because everyone's tired of the Facebook thing and I'm like but it kind of didn't happen forms are kind of old school it's totally understandable but it's kind of interesting to me that the, with the passing of oh, the Awakenings website, where there was so much m work and money put into it, and also, you know, Eight Limbs Us is still there. We've moved on to patron content as the, like, power um, focus of our publishing. But I'm like, it feels like there was an idealism when we moved here that there were, we were going to create digital spaces and everyone in the community, in the female Muay Thai community, was going to kind of like support growth and, and conversation. Also, and these things really didn't happen. Yeah, and you're like, why doesn't it happen? Because there's nothing bad about it. You're like, why would people uh, this not? Is, this is why I honestly. This is why I honestly feel and 
this is my own intuition about it, is that women still are female fighters, independent, strong-spirited women who come and train hard and like these are these are not wallflowers. They are controlled by the local male power. The local male power is could be many things. It could be a boyfriend. It could be the gym you're in, which is all male power structures, almost always. It could be your trainer, your relationship with your trainer. Local male power still is the defining compass heading what female fighters have to take. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, I, I know it, is, 100%. it is the way by which a female fighter has to define their success or failure is in the eyes of men that are locally upon them. And if you're trying to create digital, a digital conversation space or share things across distances, it will always come in tension with local male power. Because, and Kevin means local to you. Like local to you. your local thing yes, is. Yes, yeah. But the, the difficulty with that is that male power is... Oh, I didn't want to leave something, sorry, leave something out. Um, Angela's not going to websites up, but I said if I did ones we didn't know, we know about hers too. So she started one yes. female voice in the in Thailand. I didn't mean to leave her out. I just come to me. Yes. Go ahead, baby. Local male power. Sorry. I don't know. I forgot. All right. Oh, local male power is a wall. And so where you stand is your inside or outside. Uh, and so people, women, largely will choose to be inside. You almost have to choose. Like, there's no outside. You can spend time outside, but you're always orienting yourself inside the wall. Yeah. Right? And so, I think that this is just the dominant reality of every female fighter. Is they're positioning themselves in the context of the wall. Yeah, but is that is that changeable or is that just like a, it's going to take a really long time? I, I think shift. it's almost unchangeable because, like we we did the female fighter collective as an experiment. Some women in there, like Casey, had just fucking insane local male power struggle. Yes. Like that, and that the female fighter collective helped like create crisis in her life. Yeah. That was a very extreme example, but I think that that example actually illustrates a larger, much more unconscious, um, pervasive, doesn't feel insidious like, oh, I want the approval of my crew, or I want my gym to be proud of me, or, you know, these feel like healthy kind of relationship feelings as a fighter. But women, because of the gender dynamic, are forever like on the short end of that. Well, and so, so in the situation of awakening, what what was it that put that outside of the local male power walls that women it, could not it's, fully it's, support? It is that. It is that. So much energy. A female fighter is my only my intuition and opinion. The female fighter has to spend so much energy nurturing and cultivating the local male power that they're in, like where they spend all their time that they don't have an, any extra resources to dedicate to other conversation spaces. Like every woman is an island, like a complete island for their everyday experience. Like when they go to the gym, like, like when you go into Petron Rung, and Petron Rung is a very supportive gym. Like it's a pretty cool situation that you found, but you're on an island. Like when you walk in that gate, you're you're on an island. Yeah. Are you connecting to me at yes. all? Maybe the guy. But I don't want this to be a downer. That's like it is we a can't downer. connect to other women. It is a fucking downer. There are positive and mm. beneficial and no. long-standing. No. 
like I know what you're saying I, I want to be positive and everything. this is not a negative thing this is you've got to understand the real on the ground dynamic if you're going to make actual change you can't just pretend that we're going to like create a digital space or a network of blogs or vlogging or whatever and not you can't just will it with positivity. Yeah, but you're also saying that it can't really change. So you have to give some kind of... Like, well, my relationship with Emma as, it, like, it two founding of the time, like, at the time that we came and these things were starting, and we've watched many blogs disappear and start up and disappear, and we're still going. Yeah, but if we Emma's no... Emma's no, Emma's, but Emma's no longer a fighter. Like, she has less pressure under local male power she can kind of be like fuck you i don't need your approval like she in her own development like i don't want to speak for her own her own story but i read her story as like gradually freeing herself from this like compressurized male god some of her experiences at master toddy's were very difficult about trying to position herself among trainers uh among the, the gym perspective, among, with her boyfriend, like, I'm saying, this is what I'm saying. We underestimate how difficult even maintaining the status quo of acceptance in local male power is for a female fighter. Like, every single female fighter, even, like, very successful female fighters are constantly positioning themselves within local male power and spend a lot of energy doing that. And so they cannot... One, anything they do outside, like let's say all, all these women are islands, any energy they take to connect the islands together, so let's create a network of islands that automatically is going to exert some kind of... Is everything good, baby? Yeah, everything's fine. That automatically is going to exert some kind of pressure or stress on local male power because it's a different power structure, right? Yeah. A bunch of women all talking to each other or sharing voices is alien to whatever's going on in that gym. Yeah. Right? So even if it's not unfriendly, it's still alien. Yes. It runs counter to what happens in the gym. The other part is, it's just a matter of resources. Like, it takes so much energy. You have to make sure your relationships are all good in the gym. Like, if they aren't good, it produces great distress. A very immediate Immediate. Distress. Totally. So, I don't know. I think... I. My intuition is... Yeah we came at this thing this kind of naively and ideally like it's not that hard to blog this is how you can set up a blog it's fucking easy to set it up okay it takes more energy than you might think Rue thought I'll just create this digital space we can track everybody's records and do profiles and everything else the thing is is that I think female, the female fighter reality is much less evolved than we think it is. Mm -hmm. That women are still fighting individual battles in their gyms. And many of these battles are just uh, unconscious. I think like women, even if you're in a gym where, the, where you feel supported and everything, there's also that feeling like, I don't want to blow this. Yeah. Right? Like this is... This is really good for me. I don't want my crew upset with me or, I don't know. This is my theory. What's your theory about why it didn't, why all these digital spaces really haven't taken off? And every woman seems to be kind of isolated. She has her own little female fighter uh, Facebook comment section, like, the same, like, a small group of people that follow a fighter and comment there. Like, everybody feels very siloed. What, what is your feeling about that? Because um, this is a big deal. This is, like, the future of female Muay Thai. 
honestly, I feel like the very difficult, time-consuming, and valuable process of pulling together all of those records, the things that you would never think are so difficult, but they are huge. For example, the spelling of Thai women's names. Like, how many times was I getting an email that's like, are these the same girl? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, but that, like, that's not really... Things. You think that's the reason why... No, I'm the... getting to something. Oh, okay, okay. Cutting me off early. Okay. Is that the, like, the amount of work that went into just creating a floor for the house that's like, we're going to build on this, mm. but community was not built in it. Nobody lives in the house. Like, you're, you built the mm. floor and you're like, okay, we're going to like create this structure and then we'll fill it you have to fucking have the investment of filling it in the community in order to build it as it's going the thing that made eight limbs us what it is and able to keep going even under some serious adversity is that the community has always been built into it and yeah. like building up with it yeah and i think it's very hard to get that kind of community from women all around the world because of this isolation that you're talking about, because of this, like, no, I've made a pretty good structure for myself in my gym. I don't want to mess with that. Um, why, why do you, why do you, you know, I, I agree with you, but why does blogging, let's say, or vlogging, let's say a female fighter was like, I'm going to vlog my experience twice a month. Why is that potentially messing with it? Because I feel like it is, but I don't know why. Like there's this feeling like, like women aren't supposed to call attention to themselves yeah, or, totally or my coach is the one who promotes me or my gym promotes me. Like, like there's something about like, why is that messing with a good thing? It, it feels not right. But it, it feels real. Like, we have to deal with the reality that all of these women are siloed for, for, what, for important reasons. Gyms, even if they're very female positive, do not want their women to be, like, superstars of the gym. Like, they don't want them standing out. They don't want them You think being, that's true? I do. In Thailand or in the world? In the world. Um, because... Who was that in, on Phuket? Katya... Yeah, she, was able, she was she was a little superstar. Funny. Yeah, like she had the like, fuck you, I am a superstar. I'm gonna have my own channel. Mm. That actually had a lot of following. She was very funny. That's true. Like, I forgot I, about her. I really her. liked yeah. her videos. Yeah. But I didn't connect to her, and I yeah. completely should. Like there, like there's so many things about like here's a female fighter. I'm a female fighter. We're we have yeah, similar interests in ways. But it's like, that's cool what she's doing. It's over there. Like Yeah, but why is that over there? I don't, like, it's fucking because weird. Because women don't connect to each other. It's so weird because, you know, women are supposed to be the community people, like, gender-wise. And the gender is, like, organ, like bonding together. But actually, women are very competitive with each other, in, especially for um, male approval. Resources, like, that's yeah. a component yeah. of this is that... Um, a lot of the martial arts or the, let's say, combat sports world is each woman is fighting for male approval. That It's a limited approval. It's a limited resource. Limited resource. So there is this sense like, if this fighter is awesome, then maybe I, I'm less off affirmed in some weird way. Like, I, I don't know. We have to crack this nut. If we're ever going to get to this point, where female fighting takes off. Like, it's very interesting to me because you are the most documented fighter, male or female, in the history of the planet. And part of that is when you started fighting was really the rise of YouTube, the rise of vlogging, the part of blogging. Like, and you just embraced all the medium like early on you were an early adopter what's so weird is almost nobody followed it wasn't like okay you were an early adopter where were all the late adopters yeah i don't like
like there, there's something weird the about. The internet is a fucking nasty, nasty place for women. It's not like, yeah, yeah I want to get on that too. You, <laughs> you start, you yeah. start doing it, and you know that there's that early hump when people are so awful, and you don't have enough. You're like you're just at the, the exposure set. where yeah. people are so terrible, and you like kind of can't balance it and you just have to get past that yeah, sound barrier we got thing. past that but that a was lot of women hard don't get past that, that was hard men get it I don't too know. do you think they like, do you think they still that still is the case I, I don't know if that was like the weird the weird time in the internet when you started when you were getting all that stupid baby, flack. we know very smart strong women who don't want things posted because people in their own gym yeah. might give them shit about it and it's like, hey, you go to Greg and you tell him fuck you to his face because he's in your gym, but they don't do it. Like, Greg's not a real person. Uh, I just made him. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't. This is what I guess what I'm getting to is as, as we theorize or hope for or dream of female voices coming into collaboration, right? Uh-huh. It's a serious mistake to underestimate how much pressure each woman is under, even in positive conditions. Yeah. Like, we all know the, like, toxic gym. Yeah. Even the positive gym. Okay. Even the positive gym has pressures built into it. Yes. Like, where you have to walk the line to a certain way. And I don't want to make it sound like if you're blogging, your gym's not going to approve of you. It's kind of not like that. It's, there's some other, I'm still a little bit mystified about why women get so siloed and also how women do not align themselves with each other. Like we tried really hard to like share every voice we could find. And it honestly felt like it was seldom reciprocated. Like we would share other people's stuff and then nobody would share your voice back. And it was like, okay, I guess we're all on our own on this. Mm. Didn't it, did, am I not re- remembering that accurately? No, totally. It's one of the reasons that we wanted to start the Female Collective was people find it very easy to share male shit. Like, mm. look what this guy's doing. Like, look how funny. Look at this thing, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But when it comes time to share a woman's thing, you're like, I quietly liked that. Yeah, I like that. I like that. That's, That's it's weird. like, okay. And it's not... Again, it's like people aren't even aware of it. Like, I, I realize that I do it too. Like, we, mm. every so often, we're like, fuck, I have not shared anything from Emma. Yeah, even you just quietly like, liked it. I'm like, Emma, like this is it. awesome. And then I'm like, why am I not sharing that? Like, That's, why do I not think to share that? It's very weird. And I wonder if there's another element to this, which is actually something that we've missed because we're old. Mm. <laughs> we are old. We're old now. We're not old, but I'm just saying that. The um, that when we left America, a hundred years seven ago, seven years ago, on the boat, right. <laughs> <laughs> on the boat, <laughs> on the boat, <laughs> came ashore. Yes, Instagram, like the whole like. Um, I, we don't even know of this phenomenon. We only read and hear about it from afar. That there's like lots of fake fighter <laughs> like, Instagram. What? what? I'm always like, what? When I see that what? fake booking about it. Yeah, people talking about how people are fronting on Instagram and there's just this weird kind of like uh, Instagram subculture of like overhyping yourself. We don't even really follow any of these people so we don't even know that this exists but uh, we can kind of figure out that this is happening and maybe that makes it even less attractive for a female fighter to legitimately be expressing her reality on social platforms. Yeah. Like there's a lot of bullshit out there that we don't even come in contact with because we keep a pretty narrow stream. Yeah. Like we don't we don't follow a lot of people outside of our world. Yeah. I'm just saying that this is a further complication that kind of has kept female voices marginalized maybe yeah and I mean women have to struggle so hard for validation from the fucking starting line 
Mm. So to like add on to that, the like, oh, you're not real Instagram thing, or I don't, I don't even know. I don't know what that is. This like social media fakeness thing. Um, yeah, people portraying their beautiful lives or whatever. I, I, we don't even actually know how this happens. I kind of but have this thing where I'm like, who thinks that what they see on Facebook is the whole of someone's life? Like, who's the asshole out of these situations? Yeah. Um, I don't know. So maybe it's something we can talk about in the future about the, like, about thinking forward, like, how can the future be? But I, I am, like, I, using the, like, closure of Awakenings website female make I forgot what it, female awakenings the, the, that it marked the end of an era of a kind of idealism um, for female fighter voices and presence like um, it came it developed pretty much in parallel with eight limbs us and I'm like it's kind of sad it's a sad marking of a of an era but we're doing amazing things on Patreon with the, and we're trying to push the form still as a digital space. It's like neutral. It has a female, female only form section so women can talk outside the eyes of men. I don't yeah. even, as a man, I don't even read those posts. We have a female moderator. Um, so we're still trying to create these pockets of connection. But I just, I don't know, we should think hard about this siloing of women and what is the antidote for it like mm -hmm. we thought just connecting women together was the antidote but it's not a strong enough antidote yeah, yeah. good yeah. On to the rolling next topic so this this topic is could be a regular segment in Muay Thai Bones. We're going to experiment with it. We put up uh, on Sylvie's Instagram a post about the about Ning. Was that what it was? I think so. uh, it was kind of about Buddhist principles that are embodied in Muay Thai, and that you can use Muay Thai practice as a way of. Um, getting closer to Buddhist practice. And part of this comes out of the very fact that Muay Thai is incredibly, like, incredibly interwoven into Thai culture, and Thai culture is Buddhist. So they naturally express themselves. But you can more explicitly connect Buddhist principles to principles of Thai excellence, Muay Thai excellence. Yeah, like, like shared values. Shared values. And qualities. And pra yeah, and so what we're going to try to maybe do, we're going to do it for the first time today, is like try to pick a quality or a value that, and Sylvie, you are a practicing Buddhist, right? Yes. And you practice Vipassana meditation daily. 400 meters. Right? Yes. Okay. Um, so... And you're obviously a Muay Thai practitioner of pretty intense devotion. So this is really kind of like going right to the core of who you are as a person, mm -hmm. from my perspective. Turn right onto the rim. So when we were talking about this, you were thinking of Auton? Auton. So there's this word in Thai, it's a concept in Buddhism and Thai culture and Muay Thai, which is Auton, which means to endure but it also kind of means patience. Mm. Um, the, the way it's used directly in Muay Thai, I keep thinking my trainer's father, Bum Rung, he's actually my dad's age. He's like um, in his early 70s. Um, and he founded Petron Rung Gym. Uh, he grew up as a farmer and his parents wouldn't let him fight. And he wanted to do Muay Thai so badly. So he founded a gym for his sons. Um, when he could and he is very much a like older generation Thai man he's very religious he's very masculine he's very much an embodiment of Buddhism and Muay Thai like mm. together is 
bomb rung. There's like um, placards of Buddhist sayings. Yeah, they're from like, a very old book. That he has put all over yeah. the uh, gym. Yeah. So, his belief, his Buddhist beliefs, are like literally covering parts of the gym, right? Yeah. They're like mantras around the gym. Like words of wisdom or principles to follow. Yeah. Um. And so, I, I kind of like came to this concept when there was this actually like ten-year-old Russian girl training at the gym mm. and uh she would get tired in pad work like very very tired in pad work because <laughs> exhausting especially with crew new. and she would just kind of like endure the fact that it was tiring mm. and bum rung who again i i think i've said this in previous muay thai bones podcasts it is incredible to me that this like old school masculinity mm. is so inviting and celebratory of women gleeful at this gym. gleeful he, he has like it. enormous grins like if yeah. if we have a new woman at the gym training and like everything's going on he like beelines to watch mm. her and give her advice he's it's not so like strange. find the most masculine man yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which many many ties are um but she uh finished her pad work and came and sat on the side of the ring and her face was all flushed and she was sitting there and she was smiling and he just broke into the smile and he turned to me and he was like she can be she can do Muay Thai because she auton like she can endure being tired mm. and there's a very strong criticism of some usually teenage boys who like they don't like boys. being tired. Thai boys. Yeah. So yeah. what they say in Thai is they don't like being tired. Nobody likes being tired, but like they kind of can't endure it. And so it's like they, they won't really go anywhere. And so this quality of like being able to endure the fatigue, being able to endure the pain, being able to withstand the suffering with a kind of like stillness and passivity, uh, which ties back into Ning. Mm. This is where there is a collapsing between Muay Thai values and Buddhism values mm. um, and one of the, one of the things that has been the greatest gift to me at Petra Rung and why I love Kranu so much is that he's been he's given me so much patience in allowing me to take time to become what it is I'm trying to be I get mm. very frustrated with myself that mm. is not Oton <laughs> yeah. but even though you're frustrated you like keep working kind of thing. Mm. So the fact that this word means both to endure and patience to me is really beautiful because it takes time to become what you are. So in this Buddhist sense of like, there is no real time, like it is all one thing. And so instead of like, oh, hurry, hurry, I have to learn this trick or like I should be this by now or I should be mm. that. There's like stress to all of those ideas when it's just like, all of time is flat uh, and you just endure the suffering, you endure the joy, you endure the changes, like all of these things are so necessary for what it takes to actually learn Muay Thai and is a Buddhist value. They, I mean, understanding Buddhism only abstractly, uh, one of the major principles of Buddhist teaching is all of life is suffering. That what you really move towards is realizing that every, even in Vipassana training, meditation, you're just realizing that you're shifting positions to avoid suffering. That you're, that existence, much of it is stop trying to avoid suffering because everything is suffering. Yeah. The, There's no break. The thing about changing positions in Vipassana, so you have four positions. You can be um, standing, walking, lying down, or sitting. And then there are minor positions, but those are the major four. Take the exit on the left. Exit on the left. Towards okay. Samedam. Um, four positions. So, oh, okay. I missed it. So, no. Yep. No, it's up here. So I've been sitting in the car for two hours. Mm. My back hurts, my legs are tired, whatever. If I shift position, right, because like my back is hurting, I'm not escaping suffering. 
I'm mm. postponing suffering. Suffering will come to whatever my new position is, mm. kind of thing. Mm. And so this is something that's really important to understand in training Vipassana meditation is that you are not actually solving suffering. Mm. You're just changing and it moves with you in all of these different things. This is something that I have said many times when people ask me how I fight the way I do. I just fought three times in six days. The third Normal. one was a surprise Normal and stuff. my leg was pretty bashed up Before. and I couldn't really train on it. Yeah. And so I can't train on it and I'm going to go fight on it. And people ask me how I do this. Like, aren't you sore? Aren't you whatever? And I'm like, I'm sore anyway. Like I'm not yeah. escaping suffering. It's going to come with me. Yeah. I'm either sore at home doing nothing or I'm sore in another fight where you're going to be sore anyway. Like, totally. So one of the things about being able to endure fatigue or pain or frustration or doubt or any of the sufferings, there are so many multitudes of sufferings that come from learning Muay Thai is that you're never going to avoid them. Like you take, you don't like being tired. So you're going to like skip the extra two kilometers you're supposed to run on your run. Mm. It's going to follow you. Like yeah. you're going to be tired from something else or yeah. like you're going to be tired anyway. Well, this but also bends back to there's a previous Muay Thai Bones where we talked about David Goggins' philosophy, which we call square one-ism. Whoa. We're just doing a little loop. Okay. So. Uh, which is you're, you always go back to square one. You are never like, I'm on square three. Things should be easier or I should be better at everything. Like You always return to the discomfort of originally learning something or being or entering into something yeah and so in a weird way some of this is your endurance or your patience is about getting comfortable being uncomfortable or just knowing that comfort is totally transitory yeah so how does this express itself in Muay Thai? Because, okay, yeah, you just, that's one, one reason why people come to Thailand is like, wow, I get to expose myself to like Kai Muay training. Real training is just, it's not like me doing two hours at the gym after work. It's like all day pushing yourself to fatigue. The Thais aren't training super hard for the, just for the sake of it, right? Yeah, it's They're not a like aesthetic yeah. suffering yeah. practice. <laughs> but you but you can use it to understand that you're gaining access to a deeper principle of culture. Mm. Like part of the calm, the ning of the tie fighter is that they've endured so much in training and they've gained patience. Yeah. So they show patience and calm in the ring mm -hmm. because suffering is not new. Yeah. Fatigue is not new. Yeah. Like, I'm comfortable being this tired. I don't know. There's a, there is a kind of aesthetic, aesthetic, no, aesthetic, either one, <laughs> of reaching towards this perpetual suffering in, in, what, in the martial art of Muay Thai. Yeah, That's different than other martial arts or fighting styles. We have in the West also values that we want to see expressed in fighters. Mm. If you see a fighter quit in the ring, mm. it's disgusting. It's like you don't rally behind a quitting fighter. You're mm. not like, yay, right? Mm. So to not quit is to endure. So there were these two brothers out of New Jersey that fought in MMA that would just get bashed. The Millers. Mm, the Millers, yeah. They got bashed so hard. And you're like, that guy's a badass. Like, he's it's, he fights so hard, he endures positive. kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And so if you have a fighter in the ring in Thailand who, you know they're tired. It's the same thing. I say this a lot where, like, um, People come to Thailand and they like want to be given a break and a pat on the back for having worked so hard. They mm. want their trainers to be like, oh, you put in a good set, go home, shower, yeah. take it easy. 
which yeah. you might get the day before your fight, maybe, but not while you're training. And I keep telling people, I'm like, your trainer knows you're tired. Yeah. They know why you're tired. They've been training you every day. They're not dumb. Like, yeah. they fucking see it. But they don't want to see you performing your fatigue. Yeah, which is a Western habit. You have often, to learn. dramatizing how tired you are. That tired is happening. Yeah. Your trainers are tired. <laughs> like, they work every day. What did our Surat say? Everybody hot? <laughs> there was this dude at Desert Gym, a Western dude. And he was like really struggling on the pads and basically calling a timeout. And Ajahn Surat was like, what is your problem? And he goes, it's hot. I'm too hot. And he goes, you think only you hot? Everybody hot. Only you are hot. <laughs> My favorite. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Ajahn Surat is like the old school Clint Eastwood. 70 or 65 year old badass to, uh, trainer. I said this to Yod PT at our gym, who's 22 years old. And <coughs> there's a guy training with us who really like freaks out when he's tired. He thinks there's something is terribly wrong if he's really tired and he like puts his hands on his hips and walks around. Yeah. And uh, he was clinching with Yod PT and team. And so it was like this, meters. this like round Turn robin. Onto the ramp. And I smiled at Yod PT and I'm like, he thinks he's tired alone. Like, mm. <laughs> he thinks only he's tired. Yeah. Yodmiti started laughing so hard, like, 22 years old, and he knows exactly what this thing is. Like, we're yeah. all tired. Like, yeah. none of us is like, oh, I got a really good sleep last night, and I'm fucking raring to go. Like, everyone's tired. Totally. Um, but that is the, like, the difference is not can you avoid tired or not. It's whether you can endure with stoicism or not, kind of. And uh, there's another aspect of this which I don't know if you'll connect to, but it's like fighting in the pocket. Wait one second. Left two lanes and it's going to go like that. Fighting in the pocket, staying in the pocket, staying close, which produces stress and anxiety. The willingness to suffer those things too. Like, it's like acclimating yourself with super cold, to super cold water or very hot water mm -hmm. like you kind of have to kind of keep yourself in the fire for very do I go left yeah, here dang wow. and bang that. that's crazy it's a dirt road here um, like that's another dimension of patience like fork. you've got to spend time under duress and you don't want to do that like it's very it's very uncomfortable yeah I don't know, I feel like... But you don't... You don't get to be able to do that by jumping out of the cold water all the time. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know, it's very cool. I like that little segment. Maybe we can... Um, hopefully we can build on that in, uh, in future Muay Thai Bones. The Buddhism in Muay Thai? Yeah, I, I feel like it's an undeveloped line of thinking because we want to treat, well, the tendency is to treat, to abstract Muay Thai from Thailand, from its culture, whether you're stealing techniques, like I'm going to throw that elbow technique into an MMA fighting context, or the concept of like, um, it's not Buddhist, so therefore it, Westerners have, Westerners have, where do I go, left, right at the fork. Right at the fork. Um, Westerners have like um, more access to it but the truth of the matter is there has to I think if you're really going to sink into Muay Thai you have to have a change of heart that involves Buddhistic principles right yeah I think there's also a tendency in the West to be like Buddhism and Muay Thai because Muay Thai is violent and hurting people are at odds with each mm. other and it's like you're simultaneously misunderstanding Muay Thai and Buddhism <laughs> When you, when you think that they don't go together because they actually um, are... Can, is this easy go pass? Here. I think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Are uh, incredibly similar practices. That's maybe a, su a subject that we can um, broach in the future about uh, violence, Buddhism, and Muay Thai. Yeah. That would be kind of cool. Okay, next segment. Rolling. All good. 
so the next subject is uh, Arjan Gimyu, who's 78 years old, um, is now kind of a legend in residence at Veteran Rung Gym. What's so amazing about this story, well, actually there's a lot of amazing things, but what's so amazing about this story is we brought, through patron, the support of our patrons, we brought Diesel Noy into Pachamrung Gym, basically to bring, to give life to a legend that's disconnected from living Muay Thai, like an actual training Thai gym with Thai boys, stadium fighters. We like, we wanted to bring him into this. Our, he knew the owner of Petron Rung then spontaneously brought Arjan Gimyu into the gym. Like, we didn't bring Arjan Gimyu into the gym. He knew brought him in. But he was inspired by the well, presence of Diesel Noy and... Yeah, it, he even... But we have to say who Arjan Gimyu is. Well, we will. We, but I'm saying, like, he even asked you, why do you take care of Diesel Noy? <laughs> Like, why do you do this? Like, is he your father? Like, is there, what is, like, what is your alliance with Diesel Noy? Yeah, he thought it was a little weird. And I was like, because I can and I love him. Yeah, well, because Patron is strong enough that we can do this. We can support Diesel Noy, but also you idolize him. Yeah. But this is the other thing. It's like, this is what's incredible, is that we're paying respect to Diesel Noy and other legends that aren't even our own culture, right? In Thailand, and Thais take cue, like P. New is taking cue from the merit, the goodness of what you did with Diesel Noy. And now you can explain who Arshan Gimyu is, maybe people who follow us, well, this is, some of them know. But This may be, this may be ties together with, what, with who Arshan Gimyu is. Mm. So Diesel Noy lives in Bangkok and he's there alone. He has uh, no wife, he has kids, but they don't live anywhere near him. Um, he's very alone, even though he's this, like, huge... Everyone knows him, everyone loves him, but he's alone, like, all the time. Uh, we were driving with Karahat one time, and Karahat was like, if Diesel Noy has nobody to talk to, he just goes crazy. Like, mm. he has to talk to someone all the time. He's an incredibly social person, yeah. but does not have a, like, literal social network face-to-face -face in Bangkok. So bringing him to the gym where he can actually interact with people, um, teach the kids, hang out with Kranu, uh, talk, talk to shit. people, <laughs> talk a lot of <laughs> shit, be hilarious, yell at people. It's, yeah. It brings, you can see this life come into him mm. that uh, was, sometimes he was looking really not well yeah. uh, when we would see well, him. Well, he had a heart scare a couple of year, few years ago. We raised money. Yeah, but when he came health. to the gym, when we were like, okay, now you're here for a long time. We're going to keep you here, like, as a in resident. He started, like, hitting the weights. Now yeah. he's, like, trying to lose weight. And he's like, when I lose a little bit more weight, we're going to make a video. Like, he feels really good. He, like, puts on his, like, sauna pants. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. incredible. So that's that's something that Pinu is experiencing with Diesel Noy uh, because it's at his gym. And Pinu was shocked. Like, he thought he would never be able to speak with Diesel Noy even like Diesel Noy is a huge name in the sport to have him there suddenly be like so welcoming yeah. like a brother so Ajahn Gimyu was Kurnu's teacher uh, when he was in his late teens he was a Lumpany fighter a one song chai fighter Pinu Gimyu was also the padman for Gansak who's um, two time fighter of the year one of the most recognized and loved uh, Muay Thai fighters from the golden age in Thailand. And your early early trainer of me in, America. in New Jersey. Yeah. Um, incredible guy. Pinu would see Ajahn Gimyu. He's like the Freddie Roach of Thai trainers. Like mm, he, he taught a analogy. lot of people. He's like known to be this like super amazing trainer. Um, his health is not awesome right now. He had a motorbike accident and his legs are pretty messed up. So he used to be this super like um, strong, virile, like the memory that Gensok and Pinu have of him is of this like big dude. And now he's just kind of like shrunk down. Pinu would see him at Lumpany often when he would take his fighters to fight at Lumpany. And he would give him some money out of uh, what the boys were making to kind of honor him, honor his teacher, make sure he's okay. Like giving him kind of 
distant support and like be together at the stadium. When he saw that we were like bringing Diesel Noy to the gym and that Diesel Noy was adding so much and this life that came into him by being in the gym with active young fighters, Pena was like, let's bring Ajahn Gimyu. Like, let's take care of him in a more social way than just like we see you at Lumpton. And he just, he copied what you did, which is we have a hotel room for Diesel Noy and we give him money to be there. like on staff, yeah. basically. And so Arjun Gimyu, who was living in Bangkok kind of by himself, yeah. uh, has moved to Pattaya. Yeah, and he's and at the gym every day. And in the short amount of time he's been there, the transformation, his mind is good, his heart is good, his body's just kind of like out of, it's like rusty. He has also b- b- very bad knees. He's, he has yeah, serious from physical disabilities. Accident. But even in that time, his health has just like... He's getting stronger, like, every day. It's when incredible. We, I, I took pictures of um, Ajahn Gimyu coming to the gym and sent them to Gensok so that he would know, hey, this is um, Ajahn Gimyu is at our gym. It was going to be kind of short-term originally. Mm. And the first photo I sent to Gensok, he was like, ask your trainer if he can stay at your gym. He needs people. Mm. And Which was ironic because right then, Krunu started... He changed up. Totally. He was. He didn't have to be told. It was like, going to be from like Thursday to Sunday. Yeah, but it became like, no, long term. Stay. Yeah, he's yeah. going to stay. So he yeah. must have had it in his mind a little bit. And he's amazing. He has taken an interest in me, which is just awesome for me. Yeah. Um, he totally like. I'll do my pad work, and then he's like slowly come over, and he like leans himself you against know, the wall. You ropes. don't even know how big a trainer he was. He was a trainer of Lakin. He was a trainer, apparently, of uh, Thailand Pinson Yeah, which meant like, he was at the Pinson Chai gym for a we, while. Th- th- these are like, he is like the trainer of legends. This is this is the funny thing. On on Thai Facebook, people say not always in a nice way about me, Sylvia of 100 Crews. Mm. They call him Crew of 100 Gyms. Really? <laughs> uh, maybe it's also a criticism, too, in a weird way. <laughs> the, what, what you will see... We're going to see about this. Sylvie filmed a a Muay Thai library session with him when he first came to the gym because we're like, wow, we'll never get this chance again. And it's incredible because he is crumpling under modest pad work, like falling to the ground. This old man, 78 years old, he's crumpling to the ground but laughing as he falls. And then he's like, hit me harder. Yeah, he's, he, but he is so frail, but he's like, I want life. Like, he wants life. He is so full of this. But this is what I'm gonna do. We're gonna wait a month or so. He's getting so much stronger and vital. And he holds pads for the tie boys. He lay, he leans up back against the rope for support. And he's like on his belly pad and he's like calling strikes. But he's like revitalizing in such a crazy way that we're going to do another session with him and we'll put them together as a single thing and you will see what Muay Thai, like what caring for older people of the sport does to them. That phrase Muay Thai is life is not what you think it is. It's like real. Yeah. It's, it's kind of incredible. And so, I don't know. We're it's, thinking. Well, okay. What is that anime that we watched? I don't know. The Nora <laughs> the, Noragami. The God of War. Yeah. So there's this God of War who's like forgotten. Like people have forgotten about him, and so he's trying to do boons for people in order to like raise money to build a shrine, and then people will remember him because they'll go to his shrine, and then he can kind of be alive again. Mm. It's like that. These men are not forgotten, but mm. they're like on the on yeah. the edge. And then yeah. when you, like, pull them back in, they the just door. get stronger and stronger and stronger. It's crazy. Yeah. The, um... It's also amazing that... Like you said, he got you to suddenly experience sparring differently than anybody ever has. And yep. you've tried really fucking hard for years. P- 
Pinu has tried hard with you, like everyone has tried, and he's like, do this, Sylvie. And I swear to God, you didn't, that you were sparring in, your, in the baby ring on the side. I watched him with his cane creep across. You said it took him like two minutes or five, five minutes. Five minutes to get, to creep off the ring and creep around. And there's like obstacles to go with his cane to get all the way to the rope so that he can um, coach, me. coach you yeah. while you're sparring. Like even that five minutes, it's not hard. I mean, it's not easy to do that. He is an athlete. He was an athletic. He keeps telling me when I we sit, I sit next to him. He was an athletic, like powerful. He fought when he was 44 years old yeah, at Raja Domner. He he's like I used to be the best boxer in uh, Asia at my weight and number one at uh, the stadiums, like in Muay Thai he, in the 70s, I think, or late 60s. He. He remembers his body being strong, but his body now is failing him in so many ways. And he and to for that man to like do that five minute crawl across the the gym to the rope to fucking help a female Western fighter is very for me very beautiful. He doesn't want any help. Like he's one of those no. people. He's like you cannot like take his arm and help him across. But this is this is the thing. If you respect that about him yes like he was coming out of the ropes the other day and like someone kind of pushed the rope down to like help him a little bit yeah and i just grabbed his cane to hand it to him yeah totally like didn't fumble like a toddler let's like try to help you out just handed him his cane and gave me this huge smile he's like thank you took his cane did his thing put on his music but we we run at five in the morning at the gym um and three days a week they go out to um like rural running that's really nice the rest of the week it's it's in Pattaya but Gimyu was like I want to go on that run at 5 a.m. okay and so he got in the van and we went out to the lake and we run for an hour because we run 10k so we all go for the run and he stayed at the parking lot where we start and there's like a little um you know how they have these things in Thailand that have the little like workout things oh yeah yeah like obstacle course type stuff yeah he's did a like plyometric <laughs> or whatever you call it um workout calisthenics okay for an hour and so i come back from the run and i like go see him and i'm like how do you how do you feel blah 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 and he's like oh i i feel great he's like he's like my mind is good my heart is good it's just my body yeah and he was trying to ask me what the word like for handicap is in english and he's like He's like, this is this is just my reality. Like, I can't do all the things I used to do, but my mind is there and my heart is there. And I said to him, I'm like, that's better than when your body's good, but your mind's gone, oh. your heart's gone. And he just kind of looked at the distance and was like, no, that's a sin. Oh. That's beautiful. Well, I also want to say, you describe him a little bit like he's like beyond repair. We actually are... If he's willing to do it, we're going to set up a um, GoFundMe to a, to raise money for him to uh, have knee surgery, possibly on both knees, but there's one knee that's really bad. We think that if he gets knee surgery, his drive for exercise and pushing himself, will he will gain strength in his legs and be able to give up the cane eventually. He is so determined, he's one of these people that's so determined of pushing his physical capabilities. And he, when we first started talking about it, he's like, I'm too old to get the surgery, 78 years old, whatever. And I'm like, maybe some people are too old at that age, but he's not too old because of his intensity. And I'm like, we can raise money, we can direct some of the patron to him uh, to pay for these surgeries. It would be, it would be more life given to him if I, he has mobility. He's so stubborn and like incredible. I think he could live a very, very I, long time. I'll, he's one of these like, way into the ninety hundred year old. Yeah. He's got that thing about him <laughs> that he you could see him over a hundred. Um, his health. He he drives around on his motorbike all the time, and he just got 
in a motor. He it, we, apparently he got in a motorcycle accident that really fucked up his legs. Years ago. Not years recently. ago. Yeah, not years recently. ago. So there is a chance that we can not only give him a gym life, which wait, P New said that everybody wanted him in his gym. Oh, like he so said, sad and he was P. like, says this. He's like, he's like, when he was healthy, everyone wanted him. Like everyone was like, come here, come here. This is why he was at so many gyms as a trainer. He would train Gansok in the morning in Bangkok and then drive down to Pattaya and train Pinu. Which was a long drive because they didn't on have the highway. A fucking motorbike too. <laughs> yes. So far. Yeah. Um, and then Pinu's like, but then when he, uh, when he became injured, he's like, then nobody wanted him anymore. His mind is so there. Like he yeah. has so much knowledge and experience. He's an amazing trainer. Yeah. I love working with him. Banks huge, and he's totally fucking able to like uh, hold for him and do things. Uh, uh, Patron Rung is slowly becoming a really amazing place, like a little melting pot petri dish of growth, where a legend here, an older trainer there, like um, I don't know. It's a Things are growing in that gym in a really, really cool way. You there, like, Caro, like, really hardcore, serious student, female students. Like, there's a female intensity in the gym. Like, (laughs) Diesel Noy Noy has taken a very keen interest in Caro. They have similar body types, very, very tall and long. Yeah. Caro's a knee fighter. And uh, he he was helping her and, like, making her work really really hard which all diesel noy wants from you is this like maximum effort like heart all the time and Kara was giving it to him and he turned to me with his like giggle smile and he goes your friends are so strong <laughs> i was like yeah that's a friend of sylvie friends of sylvie the shit out of this chip this fucking like <laughs> friends of sylvie yeah it's totally it's true like patia is not like a glamour Muay Thai spot. No. So if you come to Petron Rung, you are willing to go to the edge of something. Yeah. Right? What Petron Rung is nowhere near the like the party uh, aspects of Patio. We don't even see it if it's a different world. But it's it's not the kind of mecca of Muay Thai. So when a female fighter comes all the way to train there to be with you, like Caro did. You know they're coming for like committed reasons, yeah. and it's kind of cool to just see this. It's just such a strange thing to have a gym where real hardcore female training is going on, and then fucking legends of the sport of bygone years growing there at the same time. Like, it's kind of crazy, baby. Like, you need both in a weird way the yeah. newest and the old. Yeah. I don't know very excited by it and he might actually it's also cool that Gonsok was your trainer early on seven years ago eight years ago and he was also and P, um, Arjun Gimu was Gonsok and Pinu's trainer yeah, like you, you, trainer, yeah. and you have this this weird legacy that, of accidental legacy that's going on yeah and I'm hoping that then Gansak, when he comes to Thailand, as he comes pretty much every year, will come to visit Arjun Gimyu, be nice, like, students of Gimyu. I have had a fantasy for a long time of Gansak walking into Petrung Rung. And really? And having that, like, crew new Gansak. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> hey! Oh, that's pretty good. And thank you, uh, everybody who supports what we do, because this is some of the, like, weird offshoot stuff. Like... This is not something we did, Arjun Gimyu, but it came out of what we were doing. Yeah. It came out from Pinu. That's very cool. Yeah. Okay. Move on to the next one. Rolling. Okay. Next topic. Uh, switching up. Kind of interesting. We were in Bangkok between fights last week. Um, and we decided to go to support Sao Sing Sorsopit, who I, we, is just Sylvie's favorite female fighter in the world. You just look at her and smile like... <laughs> She's so awesome. <laughs> She's really awesome. <laughs> she was with us in our Moy Cow Summit um, last year. Um, she not only uh, helped train everybody, but then stayed with the, us for like, well, I don't know, was it ended up being like two weeks or so. Um, 
She's the queen bee. The queen bee of Muay Thai. So we went to see her fight and also just support her, hang out with her before um, in the prep area, take some photographs. Um, and so she was fighting on a card, a promotion that's called, what is it? Hard Muay Hard No, that was the one before. Uh, this was uh, Super Champ. She was fighting on Super Champ. So they, it's the same promoter, but one of them is with MMA gloves. It's uh, new. It's called Moy Hardcore, and she fought Brooke Farrell. In a very, a weeks ago in a online. very good fight, yeah. And then the Super Champ one recently has started really promoting women, and she headlined it. She was the main event. So they're they're similar shows. I mean, to to lump everything together, these are three round fights with great emphasis on forward aggression, right? Yeah. Big, like, chawning, uh, you, basically following the old, the um, Max Muay Thai model, which was no backward fighting, um, which is tip, which is classic Muay Thai, taking away some very big Muay Thai elements, also minimizing clinch, yep. like, breaking the clinch very fast. They just want lots of, like, clashing action, which is not specifically Thai in a lot of ways. But we went to the show and we experienced firsthand the like incredible energy of the promotion. Like it's in a small area off of Kaosan Road. Yeah, it's like between two buildings almost. Yeah. Like just kind of a little alleyway. But it was like packed with people and people were fucking like erupting with excitement on every blow. It was like kind of very a very cool intensity and so for a long time we've argued that the max muay thai fusion kickboxing Model. tendency that is kind of like is kind of ruining muay thai it's in entertainment thailand muay thai. entertainment muay thai um and we all we've been kind of like we're really down on those kinds of promotions but we thought we'd discuss or talk about um are these new shows good for female Muay Thai? Because this, they're starting to open themselves to female fighters pretty strongly. This is an interesting thing. Is they, they had Sao Sing versus Brooke a few months ago. Which was like the it was a first draw. one. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay, yeah. And it was very exciting. And from that time, they actually grabbed Sao Sing kind of as a headhunter to like find women to fight on the show. Yeah, yeah. And they've had two female bouts on one show. And they have one female bout on the hardcore show, like consistently. Okay. So they're they're really trying to work women into it. Like women being on the show is which a is very point. very different than Max Muay Thai, which banned women. Yeah. You are actually the only the were for a long time the only woman ever to fight in the Max Muay Thai well, stadium. One of two, because most think you fought yeah. me. So. Yeah, you didn't fight yourself. I didn't fight myself. Yeah. <laughs> And then finally, there was there was they made an exception, and they there was one other female bout a couple of years after that. Yeah. But women are banned from Max Muay Thai because it's not seen as I don't know entertainment worthy. Yeah. Um, this is this promotion is taking a different tact, and they're starting to like emphasize women. Yeah. In their promotion, so we're like, is this good or bad for female Muay Thai? Like, we're kind of against the format because it's. Not counter to what some really important elements of what real Muay Thai is. Yeah. But it's also pulling women in now and giving them good fight pay, televised exposure. Mm -hmm. Right? What do you think? So I think it goes both ways. Um, I think that the positives are that women are being promoted, in the case of Sao Sing, by name. Like, she's becoming a, a known... Well, she already name. was, but they're pushing her even they're more. They're pushing her. Yeah. Um, they're good fights. They're exciting fights. Uh, and because they're kind of this, like, clashy, uh, lots of striking, lots of, like, aggression, it's putting women in a format that's, like, women are tough rather than, mm. like, well, we'll do the female version of things, which is, like, kind of put a lot of makeup on and mm. be on the side and, like femur your way around everything. I so think, it's coding them as tough. Yes. And and exciting. People are like, I want to see women tough and exciting. Go yeah. hard. Um, 
that I think is positive. The thing I think is negative about it is because it's not real Muay Thai, because it's entertainment Muay Thai, in the same way that you like every all-female fight show is only three rounds. Every female fight show is like makeup and pink and like all these things uh, promoted by Hooters or whatever, um, that it pushes women farther outside categorically from the traditional national stadium Muay Thai, which is what I'm really trying to drive towards. Mm. And so by being like, yeah, three round fights on TV, entertainment Muay Thai, it kind of makes it this novelty um, that pushes it farther away from the like, yes, women can be in Lumpany. But one of the reasons women uh, have not been included in Lumpany and Rajadamnern is this like preciousness of um, ability and skill and entertainment. Like, what does that mean, preciousness? Um, when in can 90 meters, go left. Okay, I think you can take that. You think? No, sorry, guys. I, here it says Chonbury. Oh, you have to stay in these Keep lanes, right at the fork. Yeah, see this. Um, Preciousness of technique, you were saying. Uh, basically, how do I put this where I don't sound like I'm being an asshole? Don't don't be an asshole, baby. So, Chiang Mai has a lot of female fighters. They fight very, very often. Mm. There's not gambling. There's not a lot of, like, um, kind of meters. competitive pressure right. in that tank. And so... The style of fighting leans towards this, like, just do enough to win kind of... Um, it's point fighting, to be really honest about it. It's very it's very sport and less, like, um, performance. Like... Uh, I don't know what that means, actually. Dominant honor, whatever. Basically, the... the not every fighter, but, like, the majority of fights like that would not go at Lumpany. Like, they're not getting gamblers very excited. Well, yeah. There's a really weird thing, which is Muay Thimur is the most appreciated dimension of Muay Thai broadly, among men, let's say, that if you have artful, like some aren't, or Sanchai, if you have artful fighting, you're really at the height of Muay Thai skill. Female fighting is much, in Thai, from, from the Thai female fighter, is very Muay Thimur. Like that's where females gravitate towards. Unfortunately, in the, in the version, the female version, that technical thing becomes like point fighting which means it lacks the aggression and the power of male Muay Thai fighting. You have to give this to What do I do? Oh, one second, we're paying a toll here. 55. One second. Cup. So, in the weirdest way, High female point fighting embodies the highest form of Muay Thai because it's technical, but it still lacks the teeth the that the male female fighting female fighting has. Right, right. Oh, right. thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it, 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 it embodies a kind of like weird contradiction. Yes. Right. And part of what we wanted to do with Queens of the North promotion, which is a promotion we were, we we're going to try to put on in Chiang Mai, was to like provide some of that competitive pressure, inject fi financial um, reward into the Chiang Mai fight scene so that the technical female Chiang Mai fighting... Wait. Rolling. Rolling. Uh, continuing on, we had a battery... I was talking about the Queens of the North promotion, the, something we're trying to do through our patron, um, is 
a promotion we're thinking about put using to inject uh, competitive intensity in the Ching, Ching Mai female fight scene among Thai female fighters, uh, not the Western fighters there, um, to raise their level of, um, I don't know, what would you say, like uh, dominance or performance? Because right now, the their heavy fight schedule and the lack of uh, gambling pressure in the city has produced a lot of kind of like technical, but very kind of like point fighting victory, uh, which it's weird because the Thai female fighter is embodying Moi Thi Nur, which is very esteemed, but without the teeth of the masculine version. There's of it. not as strong an incentive to. Uh, well, that's you're saying the female fight fighters. Hard, yeah. yeah. So we're trying to change that with the with the Queens of the North promotion to give financial incentive to fight in a more uh, intensified uh, way. Because female fighters, if they're just point fighting, are not going to get to the meeting. Thai female fighters. Yeah. There's a value to fighting the way they're fighting. Beating a point fighter in a point fighting uh, scoring system is a real achievement. Like, like having to learn how to win those kinds of fights is a very big important thing. It teaches you a lot of a lot about fighting. It's not just some kind of bullshit fighting scoring, artificial scoring. It kind of reminds me of gi versus no gi. That training with a gi in BJJ, you learn a lot of skills that a lot of techniques that are kind of important. The same thing as when you're fighting those kind of like point fighting fights against high female fighters that can win a fight by just evading you and slipping you. Theatricizing you. Those are important components of fighting skill, but those alone will not take Thai female fighting to the level of Limpini, yeah. right? So, sorry to go on about this. Do you not? Are you not on it? No, like totally. What I'm we're, you're, you have to bridge it back to. So these yeah. So i So what's interesting about these entertainment shows, like um, um, what is it called? Super Champ and, and Hardcore. hardcore. Yeah is that they are also pressuring female, Thai female fighting fighters into growing teeth. Yeah. Right? It would be a shame if Thai, if Thai female fighting turned into super champ, like these kind of clashy, like Muay Thai itself would be at risk yeah. if this became the dominant fight form. Yeah. But there is something that's happening there in those shows. like. A perfect example of this is Saifa. Mm -hmm. She Saifa is a was a world champion. She's a knee fighter. She's in the north. I think she kind of has no opponents anymore, so she very seldom fights and trains uh, seriously. She, she's a very skilled technical fighter, right? Yeah. She got booked onto what was it? The hardcore, hardcore show with the MMA gloves. She fought Callista, who's very, very tough Western uh, Estonian part Thai fighter, and um, I was shocked at how well Saifa did. Yeah. Like, my our we, feeling. We thought under that rule set, it would be very difficult for her. She's she a just, she's okay. a clinch fighter, and there's no clinching. Yeah. Right. She and she's maybe a kicker sometimes, but she's not a puncher. She came prepared into that fight with a right cross, and she threw a right cross straight. We've, we've watched Sa uh, Saifa before, and yeah. we've never seen that never. Like, from her. Never. She just pulled a thing to like... She threw that straight. right cross like 40 times in that fight. Like, right cross, right cross, right cross. Because she obviously was cued in. This is what they're scoring on that platform. She ended up losing that fight uh, to knees. She told us later that the rule set told her she cannot pull the head down. Like, you can't lock it all and turn. Oh, is that what she said too? I heard you can't pull the head down. Yeah, she said that to me, but it sounded like you you are not allowed to do any kind of like clinch turn. Yeah. So I don't. I guess the point is, wow, this is an 
this is an older, uh, older, she's like 22 years old. This is an older Thai fighter whose career has already arced. And here she came to the, like, the hardcore uh, yeah. show with a whole new set of tricks. Yeah. Like a whole new way of fighting. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, this is really good, actually. Mm. Like, this is the growth of female Thai fighting. You seem kind of quiet, like, yeah, just nodding. Like, we're on a podcast, so we've got to jump in. I really felt like, for Saifa because as a knee fighter, as a clinch knee fighter, not just a knee fighter, to go into a show where they're like, no clinching, you're like, how am I supposed to fight? And she's fighting Callista, who also is a knee fighter, but with elbows. And so it was that, like, right cross, and she didn't throw a lot of knees versus knees and elbows. Um, and it's a very exciting fight. Like, I did not think that was going to be an exciting fight. Mm. And it was good. Um, also, Jitty, another northern fighter. Yeah. Fought on the card. Yeah, she fought against a Cambodian fighter. Um, and that was like... I I went up to watch it. Kevin didn't watch it. But it was an incredible mess that was still like... This is not because they're unskilled. It's because they've been put in a scenario where the jar is shaken and it's like, go. Yeah. Um, and so you could see the like adjustments they were making to that style um and it it was a, the crowd really liked that fight i i was like watching through people i had a terrible okay but it's on. not important the the individual experience is more like what what do we draw from that about female more type I mean, it feels like a there's gonna be a lot more females on here like site uh sao sing is head hunting i feel like in the same way that in the west there are people who are like i don't like watching women fight mm. which is part complete fucking sexism and part like yeah women are on a different level than men mm. that happens in thailand the excitement that the crowd had for those female fights mm. and we've been to shows where like the female fights are the best like um, every show <laughs> <laughs> and then that uh that inter women fight in the north that Pong put on, that Sao Sing was oh, the was a great show. tournament. Yeah. Fucking amazingly good fights. Yeah. Like, really, really good fights. So, the the thing about getting women female Muay Thai up is there has to be interest and there has to be money. Yeah. And this is showing both of yeah. those, which is good. And there's another dimension of that, or what you're, another way of saying what you're already saying is that female fights when fighters have to start being coded with the same code that, that is hyper-masculine. That's the same thing about you fighting on Karchuk cards, uh, Callista fighting on Karchuk cards. Karchuk for a long time, which is gloveless fighting, knockout or nothing, was seen as like hyper-masculine, very uh, violent. You would never put females on these cards. Now, you and Callista are like regular on these cards. Yeah. But this is the thing. It's like... The forms of fighting that are hyper masculine, that are coded, women have to um, enter into those zones and perform exceptionally yeah. in order to eventually be able to cross the threshold at Lumpini Stadium. Yeah. There has to, you have got to kind of like cross code over, cross pollinate over and over. So women being able to come into this new entertainment Muay Thai format. Is pretty, I think more is much better. More is gained than is lost. Especially because Thai female fighters, even especially of the North, have got to move beyond their point fighting victories. Like, yeah. I understand why it's developed that way, but we need to put some teeth into the skill level of the Northern fighters, uh, I think. So, I see that happening. Yeah. yeah so. And they're pulling women down from the North. Which is kind of which which cool. crazy, yeah. yeah. Which is part of Chiang Mai is the mecca of the fighting in the world. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty good. We're rolling. Rolling. Next topic on our epic drive back home from Hua Hin. The 
this is uh, time goes by fast but also slow at the same time when we're shooting these but it's kind of good to just talk Muay Thai yeah like the way that we do I hope, hope everybody's enjoying it follow the blue sign okay so this topic is switching it up again as we do in the Muay Thai Bones way Sylvie wrote an article I don't know maybe four or five years ago six years ago um, why your Muay Thai dreams might not come true in Thailand so and, it, and it was we'll probably link to it in the description um, one second make sure we don't get on the wrong highway Chonburi um, which is you come to Thailand with these like big dreams of the kind of commitment you want to have and uh like this tra life transforming kind of experience and you run into some uh, unexpected hurdles things that you don't imagine that are going to influence you and I think we want to focus on one of them which is very often when you if you're going to come and train for well, we're talking about long term training like three months six months a year one of the difficult things is that when you enter a gym that has Westerners in it, and long-term Westerners, you end up being strongly influenced by the Westerners that are already there and yeah. that have been there for a long time. Yeah, and have created their own routines and levels and settings. Yeah, they've found a groove for themselves. And I don't know, how do you want to say this? It's like... Uh, gyms develop kind of satellite questioners. Yeah, they like leave and come back. It's 600 meters. Well, I don't know about like leaving, but why, why do you say leave? Like they travel and come no, back? No, they go home and then they like come back for oh, two or three months. Yeah, they've no. They've been coming for like six years or something. Yeah, I'm talking about people who live in Thailand mm. and they uh, are satellites in the sense that they're not like full on committed fighters they whatever you think you want to do in your yeah, three or six that. months they've already gone through their first three or six months mm -hmm. and now they've settled in yeah right one second um, you have thoughts on this maybe I, yeah. I feel like I'm just like no, no, no. jabbering we'll jabbering away um, well I guess I'm going to ask you to go because I'm going. Every, I'm already going. Every yeah. gym has this. Like, every gym has this. And it's that you you come and you have your experience and you establish something and then you move into a different phase or whatever the thing is. But some of these people who stay in Thailand for a long time um, and have been coming to the same gym for a long time, they... Um, they basically have their glory days behind them. Mm. And so they're like, they have this like memory of their like thing that they did, which is what you're trying to do. Mm. Like you're the freshman who's real excited about high school and they've got like senioritis kind of thing. Yeah, in a weird um, way. And the thing is that like in any given gym, um, Turn right onto the you kind of fall into or mirror or like settle into a level that is in line with what the level is at that gym. If you're a Westerner, you might end up just by default because of social whatever, leveling off where the other Westerners are. Yeah, Unless yeah. you make a point to be like, that is not my level, my level is well, really high. it's natural that when you come into a foreign environment, you look to your right and to your left to find out what normal is. And this is just the topic here is really about it's kind of a warning it's like many of the people that you're going to take your compass reading from are in a different place than you are yeah. and they have already gone through the enthusiasm and not only that they have a they can also also develop a pride for being like i know the ropes this is how it's done and 
could even not even be welcoming to your like intensity intensity like if you want to come here intense you might find yourself kind of dragged down to a lower intensity and commitment by people who are here for longer term and this come happens kind of like unconsciously yeah but sometimes it's like people come they fight their few fights and then they just stop fighting but they just come and train for conditioning and kind of like pretending to be a fighter yeah and it's interesting because it's not only westerners like when i first came to petrangrung ptt uh was the kind of like top dog at the gym mm. and um he had become Omnoy stadium champion and was like kind of transitioning into Thai fight, which is what he does now. And at his experience level and what he was then moving into in terms of what kinds of fights he would be having, his training regimen was real. I've been doing this for a really long time. Like it was not, it was not intense hard work. But, but he, there was something yeah. inspiring about his, the way he would come in and just fucking slam that bag. Like, you can take positive things from people who are at a different level. You just don't want to shake off your intentions and intensity and by default match other people. Yeah, I, I think there's a much lesser danger of you mimicking the ties and falling into a much less intense version of things. Just culturally. It's like culturally you will look to the Westerners who are like you. Yeah. And I'm just like it's okay. Like if you want all of these lives everybody lives a different Muay Thai life. The point is is that when you become long term in Thailand you often make compromises with what you initially came and dreamed of yeah and now this is your new normal your new stability and if you're coming fresh we're like stay inspired yeah keep your dream burning in front of you it doesn't matter how other people are other westerners are performing in your gym whether they're fighting or not fighting or fighting infrequently, it does not matter because, and then Sylvie's the golden fucking example because she's like, I'm going to fight two times a month first, and then I'm going to fight three times a month. Nobody's fighting that much. Like, when, when she was doing this, she was creating her own beat, her own vision of what she wanted because we were like, we value fights. Now... With Sylvie setting the example publicly, women are fighting and men are fighting far more than they ever did when, before we got here. The point is, you don't, don't be like Sylvie, but I'm like, be like Sylvie in this way. Keep your dream alive. Whatever the thing was that got you to Thailand and made you have this kind of like um, burning passion, don't get it readjusted unless that's what you want yeah. like if you're like hey I like kind of like that life like, teaching a little English and training sometimes and fighting once in a while like maybe that appeals to you and that's totally fine the whole part is make it a choice yeah you have to make it a choice don't yeah and I'm I don't know like there is this weird kind of thing that I kind of like chafe against which is like Westerners who are in gyms for a long time are kind of like, I'm the expert. Like, there's a pride they have for being familiar with everything. Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like it feels uncool. I don't know. Just agree. Do you feel it feels uncool to me? Like, I guess it's very natural. Like, you, if you want to talk about high school, it's a the, the, the juniors thing. and the seniors have a pride in their familiarity with the school and like we don't really have to do that stuff yeah it's I don't know I, I don't think that they're consciously trying to drag anybody down but it's also one of those things where like you're not going to be criticized by someone who's doing more than you so mm. when they're like take it easy like blah 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 like 
I'm I'm a dick, so if I'm working and someone comes and wants to like chat with me, I just keep working. I'm like, yeah, it's a, we're not turning yeah. this into a like conversation thing. But if you're polite and you're social and you like, you want to kind of like meet people at the gym and stuff, you can totally get like pulled off your uh, training to like chat with someone who's not there to yeah. like do a lot of work. Um, and I think that you just, you don't have to be rude. I'm not rude. I'm like, sorry, I'm doing my work kind of thing. But like, um, it, it's one of those things where the, the lukewarm water will make everything lukewarm. I'm actually really impressed with Kiro coming because you train really hard, but your training has evolved. You've been doing this seven years every day. Pinu still marvels at your fucking training. Like it's beyond Thai Thai boy training, Thai style training. But Kiro came with a fucking idealistic intensity and she's training kind of above what you're doing. Yeah, like, so. but she held her, her fire. And she's like, Sylvie has been doing this seven years. She's at a different place than me. She's like, I'm just coming fresh to this. I fucking love training. I love Sylvie's example, but I'm going to create my own vision of my own dream. She, it's fucking cool. She gets so mad when a fight gets like canceled or moved because she's like, I miss training for this. Yes. <laughs> no, there's no fight. But that's how you were like for the I, fucking longest I'm still time. I'm like that. I'm like, Kevin, let's get back. I, I know you're so ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. But you create your own vision. Like, I just like uh, this is the special thing about Thailand is like yes it has hierarchy and structures but really in a Thai gym you can make whatever you want out of it if you put investment into following the instruction of a particular padman or asking questions or doing 300 teeps and 500 knees every set like extra stuff it will be noted it will be seen like you will get something out of that yeah and then like it's one of the it's one of the more beautiful things it's like a cornucopia of opportunity but part of the, i guess this topic is kind of about don't take cues from people around you and this is actually connected to other things we talk about every person in the gym space creates a vibration yeah every single person like i come and watch Sylvie train right now I'm sitting on the couch I'm creating a vibration uh, Westerners who come into the gym for have been coming for years and they just sit on the sit on the side and talk the whole time a vibration Kiro doing 500 teeps on the pole a vibration and it's like one of the things that Sylvie tries to do and we talk about is raise the level of the gym by your vibration like even if you're surrounded by fucking like killing beast Thai boys smacking the pads and that's the vibration you can bring something to the gym that can raise the vibration Yeah. and the vibration will feed and support you like yeah. it's not just being like donating this yeah it's it's understanding what your gift is to a place. Mm. Well, what do you, can you open that a little bit? Unpack it? If you understand that you impact a gym, mm. space, vibration, energy, whatever, like, I don't know, it's, it does it's like that lyric from Creep, I want you to notice when I'm not around. Mm. There are people at the gym, you fucking notice when they're not around. You know, like, I gotta say, it kind of sucks because Champ didn't come. Like, yeah. And it's not only because he's my training partner, and so now I don't yeah. have that training partner, but it's like he adds something to the space. Like, yeah. when he's working on the bag and doing his thing, or like has to leap into the ring because Cruden called him in or something, yeah. like, it has this quality to it. Um, and there are people 100% who I notice when they're not around because it's a positive thing. It's like, oh, that isn't here. Don't be that. And I think a lot of people aren't. I think that tends to be the, like, repeat kind of stinky sock that got lost in the corner or whatever. Um, but I think I think it's also this, like, not only understanding what 
what you have to offer to a space, but being true to it. Like, I remember Ram Ba saying when I was like, what kind of fighter does well at your gym? A Westerner. What kind of Westerner do you want? And he said, I want someone who has Kayan, which means like hardworking, self-discipline. Like they don't have to be told everything to do. And he goes, look, if you're on vacation and you want to train, that's fine. But be honest about that. Like he, there's he room, this? He's like, there's room for that. If you just want to like hit pads on vacation, go to the beach, 100% you're welcome at my gym. But don't pretend like you want to fight and then actually want to do that other thing. Like know who you are and play your part in the orchestra. And I think that's what we're telling people to do is like if you have this enthusiasm, you were given a part in the orchestra, play your part. Don't yeah. start playing the third violin part because there are more of them. And, like, the, and this is just was directed towards people who come with idealistic passion. You can also come and be like, I just want to hit pads and relax and drink beer in the night. Like that totally. too is a thing. Totally. Like it's not. It's, there's no, there's like, nothing no, wrong I don't with want it. To fight. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. But you can contribute to the gym in other ways. Yeah. Like totally. being cheerful or whatever it is. Like I don't know. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, we thought it'd be worth talking about. I know people like seriously we did save up a tremendous like a lot of money for themselves and they're like I'm just gonna throw myself into this experience and it's gonna change my life like yeah. I want it to change my life and there's tremendous amount of effort that takes into coming here into Thailand safeguard your dream yeah right it's yours yeah it's yours yeah. that's pretty good baby take the lead on that? So by You're... taking the lead, I get to interpret what that means to me. Okay. <laughs> so early in my fight career in Thailand, I was already fighting a lot because we didn't know how long we were going to be here and I wanted just as much experience as I could get. I will never, ever forget sitting on the floor at AMA telling Gansak, who I was taking a private from, that I was going to go to Thailand in New Jersey. Yeah. Um, and we thought we were going for maybe like six months to a year. I think we were like six months. It would be a dream if it was a year. And Gansak was like, great, get as much experience as you can. No, he meant fight. Yeah, that's what yeah. he meant. So I was like stoked on this, like just go and like, when you go to Disneyland, go on all the rides. <laughs> like, it's, so pretty early in my career, I was fighting a lot. And then there was this like, alter voice that was coming of people who were kind of like side-eye criticizing how much I was fighting and they would use this phrase it's quality not quantity yeah. which is basically like I pick and choose my fights to be like the best fights all the time and it, dudes it was only women saying this dudes tend to say like I wait in for all of my fights as though that means that like they were all really important because you had to cut weight or something but the thing is I fucking something spoke to me and was like seeing something in my soul when Gansak was like get as much experience as you can because to me the fallacy of quality is better than quantity or yeah is that with quantity there is variation with quality, you may not get very much variation. Right. So. And not much repetition. Yeah. So, the the frequency with which I've fought for the past seven years, um, it allows me to use fighting as part of my training. So rather than like train, 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 train. Now let's test myself and see whether I pass the test with this fight that's been organized and set up to be as quality as possible you go and you fight with all kinds of variation of disadvantages things you weren't expecting uh, making the same mistakes because it's so hard to bring real fight pressure into regular training and so by using a fight as training you're using that pressure as part of your training instead of it being like a test for what your whole thing is 
so I think that why I've always really valued the quantity aspect is that you are getting as much experience as you can, like Gansak was saying. Well, we've always had this feeling also, a uh, little side note, people who say quality, not quantity, are people who have no access to quantity. Like, they are often in small fight scenes with very limited opponent opportunities. Yeah. And so they have fight records of 20 fights or 40 fights at the most. And their only way of quantifying their own success is, well, all my fights were quality fights. They don't even have the opportunity of quantity. One of the gifts of Thailand is, and Sylvie's kind of opened the door on this, is you have the opportunity for quantity and quality. Like, it's actually a false dichotomy. Yeah. I mean, you're fighting the best fighters in the world way above your weight class now. Like, it's like not even funny anymore. But it's like this feasting on quantity in a rich Muay Thai culture provides like endless variation yeah. and experience. And I'm like, I don't know. I understand the other philosophy, but I'm like, if I'm like, if you did something only 20 times, anything, are you really in it? at the peak of your knowledge, like, if you put out 20 fires, are you at the peak of firefighting knowledge? Like, every time you go into the fire, you learn something. And there's like another dimension to this, which is not so much like, I'm gonna be the best fighter because I have the most experience. Every experience is precious. It like reveals something to you about yourself. Right? So almost like, I don't know, one of the things that's governed what we've talked about when we do discuss this is when you've stopped fighting, there's no more fights. Yeah. That experience is done. And fighters struggle with this all the time. Yeah. We're like, that day will come. Let's get every single opportunity we can before that day comes. Yeah. And I think that if you stuff yourself at the feasting table, when that day finally comes, it will be far less difficult. <laughs> I don't know about that. You don't know? You don't think when I you think have it, four, 500 fights, you don't think that that's going to be like, you're not going to be sated? No. I think there's no easier heartbreak. I think it breaks your heart either way. But to me, it's like something that, that has intense value and learning possibility and growth. There is no... quantity dichotomy it, imagine you travel right mm. you're like I travel all the time I've been to a hundred cities yeah. well I've only been to the ten best like what the oh. fuck are you talking about yeah, like, it's, that's very it's an experience it's not a like collection interesting analogy um, and so I think that it it doesn't mean that that one is better than the other um, but does it not? Well, I mean, you make a choice, right? You make a choice. You make a choice which one is better. Or what's important to you out of it, yeah. I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's very interesting that we're like... Part of why we committed to this uh, quantity is that female Muay Thai really lacked any real belts. Like, there was no ascendant and apologies to anyone who has a belt who feels like they are the world champion and the greatest because of that. It's like, we recognize that belts were highly political. They were highly or orchestrated promotional 
themselves inventions really and they did not really represent some kind of apex mountain peak to climb to so Fima Muay Thai kind of had no mountain peak there is no real world champion type ascent and so we had to create our own ascent like well, what will represent excellence and if nothing else it's like let's have all the experiences like give up tons of weight against somebody who's not super good or give up tons of weight to somebody who's a fucking world champion like everything in between yeah and i'm like i don't know we had to create our own standard of what achievement would be and now it's at a ridiculous number i can't imagine like if we play this back 10 years from now and you fought 471 times I'm, it, this is like the craziest goal that you've ever taken i don't even know how we're gonna find another 240 fights like they're getting very difficult to find but every, we run into these walls all the time and we always overcome it I guess what we want to talk about is not like my way is the best, but rather encourage the preciousness of fighting. Yeah. It's, I don't know, it's like that scene in Amadeus where the king or whatever is like, it's too many notes. Mm. And he's so offended and he's like, which ones should I take out? Whoa. Somebody in a hurry. Um. If you were to be like, and people have asked me this in interviews where they like send the same 20 questions to people or something, or like, what's your favorite fight or what's your hardest fight or whatever the thing is. Right. I'm like, each one is so individual. Like, mm. each one to me is so precious in its own way. Even the shit ones. Yeah, but the, it's like, that was an experience to itself. The, I fought three fight. times in six days, and you're like, which one of those was the quality? Yeah. But like, the fucking last fight, the fight you had last night, had so many negative things about it, like uh, the promoter lied about her weight and the ref was clearly fucking, like, shaping that fight so you couldn't win. Like, that was bullshit, and fucking promoter was in your opponent's corner. Like, a lot of things that can make you feel bad. You got cut, which is embarrassing. Like, a lot of it wasn't great. You fought a fucking skilled opponent giving up at least six kilos in a kind of like no man's land uh, scenario. That's a fucking great fight. Like, I don't care how shady this thing was or whatever. It's like, that's a fucking great experience that you can be like, yeah, I'll fight in two days, whatever. Like, all the negatives that kind of cast a shadow on that, I kind of... I embrace those things. Like, was that a quality fight? I kind of think so. That's what I'm saying. All three of them are. Like, all 258 are. Like, it's yeah. no shitty fight. Yeah, I just, uh... I'm saying the ones that are kind of like the wonk, the most wonk ones, are some of the coolest to me. <laughs> like, like, they're the most... They have edge to them or something like that. Well, that's, that's the thing. You're like... Like, most of the quality fights, the supposed quality fights, like, on a big promotion or something, are the least enjoyable or most forgettable fights to me. Well, it's like... I don't know. We're married. We decided yes, to spend our entire lives together. That's right. Which day was the best? All of them. <laughs> right? Like, there's no, like... We really peaked at that second honeymoon. <laughs> like, it's, it's all... We, we only see each other seven times a year for quality days. But they're really good days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's kind of like that. It's kind of like the fighter's life. Um, it's like uh, getting rid of the notion of the fight camp, which is connected to the, like, definitive fight, the fight that reveals who you really are and what you're skills really are and I think that's a aspect of fighting in general in Thailand about how the record doesn't really mean what it means other places in the world 
Yeah. Um, there's a there's like a sea of fighting, it's, and there's a little bit of a thing like a, what was that Tom Cruise movie where he keeps living the same day over and over again? Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow, like in a Groundhog Day way, like when you fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. You, you repeat things over and over. You feel like you're not growing or changing. But each time you go around, you learn a little something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I'm like... And for people who are like, quality, not quantity, uh, my 25 fights, all this and that. Okay, picture your 25 fights. Now picture 50 more, which were not quite quality but were a variation, right, of size and skill, throw those 50 on top of your 25. Which fire do you, would you rather have been at the end of that? And I'm like, I don't know, people prize like undefeated records and fought only the best. I'm like, fight more, fight big, fight if you can, like, I don't know, there's something about this thing like surrendering yourself to the volume. Mm. Um, and it's very cool that there's now women in that have gone to Chiang Mai to do this Maggie fucking fighting up a storm. Like, we went, was it more than a year, two years ago? We were at Joe at Hong Tong when it just opened, and he's like, Maggie wants to just do what you do. Yeah. And I'm like, trying to, he's like, I'm trying to explain to her that promoters won't let you. She's fighting like three in a row. Yeah, yeah she's still, but she pushed herself to do that. And I'm like, now women are fighting much more. Like the Estonian woman, Callista, fighting like fucking crazy. Lot, yeah. Like, these are, this is a new way of fighting. Like, uh, Caitlin Young is a big proponent of this too. Like, fuck the belts, just fight and fight and fight. Yeah. That's I don't quality. know. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. We're ending on that, right? This is our last, our last segment. Uh huh. Whoa. It's frozen, but the time's going. Oh, good. Um. What? Where are we signing off, babe? You want to yeah. help me with this? Okay, um, we, that was going to be our last segment, but we have a little sudden ending. We have one more segment we're going to do. Uh, it's not really a film review, but we like sometimes to talk about films we've seen and how they impact Sylvie or how they relate to Muay Thai or the life process. And we went and saw Dark Fate. Is that what it's called? Terminator yeah. 3 or what? however they number it, right? The latest Terminator. And one of the most interesting things about this film was how powerfully Sylvie was affected by the Grace character. Yeah, so two things. One, when Kevin was like, I want to go see Terminator, I said something <laughs> along the lines of no fucking way. <laughs> Did not want to go see it. That's I'm, okay. I'm of an age, and I've thrilled her brother's that I grew up with the Terminator movies. Like, this was a very impactful, like, nail in my growing up. Stamping. Nostalgia. Hardcore. I remember going to see T2 in the theater and chanting, Arnie, 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 for Who were like... You? Was it you and your brothers? I went with Nell, John, and his friend Jeb. And Nell and I sat in the balcony because we weren't allowed to sit with John and Jeb because I was not cool. Oh my God. Uh, I think That's I was, terrible. I think I was like, I don't know, eight or nine years old or something. So you were chanting Arnie with Nell. Totally. <laughs> and like, I have this, I've written about this. I have this very, very strong memory of when, because I'd seen Terminator, so I knew who Sarah Connor was. Right. And there's Sarah Connor in that movie, but Sarah Connor in T2 is not one. She's not like Sarah Connor in Terminator, but she's also not like any other fucking character. People pair her with Ripley. Yeah. Not the same. No. Like I love both of them. I love Ripley. She's on my wall. But like Sarah Connor 2, 
I had never seen a woman like that. I'd never seen a body like that. I had never seen her like <laughs> wolf mother. <laughs> Let's back up slowly <laughs> and just <laughs> scratch this idea. I love Sarah Connor. She got into me young and was like very influential. So to be like, we're gonna go see the next T2 that they're kind of like remixing or whatever, I was like not interested. They did such a great job with Grace, who's in this new Terminator. Did it, I, when we left the theater, I told Kevin, I'm like, what Sarah Connor was to me when I was eight or however old I was, that's what Grace was for me today. That's so to incredible it. to hear you say that because I know what Sarah Connor, what I've known that, that she made this huge imprint. How can a character imprint you as strongly at in your 30s as you can be when you're nine? I mean, it's just... You're nine. When I was when I was young, I had never seen that before. It was my first one. Yeah. So that was a like kind of amazing experience by itself. This time, I've seen Sarah Connor. Like I I have a, totally a template. I'm kind of like Sarah Connor now. Right. Um, you kind of, in a weird way. And there have been some kind really of excellent a... feminist characters recently, like with Captain Marvel. Mm. Um, like they've they've been doing a pretty good job of like powerful women them yeah, yeah. in kind of thing. What was amazing is they did not fucking do the like rough sketch. Let's recreate Sarah Connor. Like mm. they didn't just kind of do her again. They they had an homage in her body was very much like Sarah Connor. Right. Too. But it's portrayed similarly. Similarly. Yeah. But they made her fucking enormous. Like it was <laughs> it was so cool and she was never self consciously like, look how sexy I am in this whatever. Like I kept talking about how she was always wearing the men's clothes because she's so big. Like she would always mm. steal the whatever oh, yeah. it's like let's dress like the security guard or whatever. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, there yeah. would be a woman and she couldn't wear her clothes. Like that's, she had to take the men's clothes. That's very interesting. Um and I they didn't notice that. They I mean, it was it was part of them doing an homage to that first Sarah, literally the first Sarah, the Terminator Sarah, mm. also the T2 Sarah, and like kind of showing this evolution okay. kind of thing. Um, but man, I loved the way she fought. I loved the way she um, was. Well, what was so satisfying in the evolution itself? Because, as you say, they couldn't just copy her and do a... Like, they improved on her. Like, in the way that the T... The T-1000... The T units keep improving over time. Yeah. In, like, they become more sophisticated. There was this way where the Sarah Connor model got improved on in that movie, which made her super impactful. Like, I can't even really imagine... What are the points of identification for that Grace character that was just like, wow, that's identifiable? I think there's a... Oh, I don't want to, like, accidentally talk about... I don't want to, like, vague book. <laughs> what were you saying? There's a difficulty that non-cis white men have, which is that everyone other than that... Non-cis? non-cis white male okay. anything other than oh, that category okay. Okay. is underrepresented okay yeah I got you film right so we've all learned to varying degrees because there are like super not represented right. groups right we have all learned to identify with what there is mm. so you learn to identify with the you know um Tony Stark. Like, who the fuck can identify with Tony Stark? <laughs> and yet, we do. Yeah. Like, because that's what's there. So then, when you get, like, the the crumbs of someone who is a little bit like you, or um, is strong in these ways or something, it, like, kind of blows your mind in this exciting way. Mm. I think that the, the way her motivations 
were written um, so that it was not like a, well, women will identify with this because like, women like this or mm. something. Her like um, hardcoreness or her like stick to the mission, mm. which normally like a Terminator stick to the mission is because you're a machine. Uh. Sarah Connor, too, stuck to the mission because she was a mother, but she was also crazy. Right. Those are, it's cool to like put those together. I loved that she was like a fucking crazed animal slash mother thing. That was interesting. Right. But to make Grace a soldier, mm. anyone can identify with that soldier thing. Mm. And to have her be a woman rather than like, she was almost, I can't remember his name, um, the John Connor's father in Terminator. He was a soldier. Mm. And so he came back. And, like, the way that Sarah Connor gets him up when he's, like, falling apart, mm. she goes, on your feet, soldier. Right. And, like, she has to kind of take on this, like, authoritative, like, speak to that aspect of him. Right. And to have that that echoed in a female character without it being a, like, look, everybody, we're redoing this thing and yeah. we're making it a woman and look yeah. how she's a warrior. <laughs> it's yeah. like, we'll put warrior bangles on her or something. <laughs> like, it was very... Um, Warrior Bengals. We we also watched a documentary on Alien where all the characters were written to be interchangeable male or female. Mm. And I'm like, that's why Ripley was so good. Like, that's... Unless she was written as a man. Yeah, that's the thing. Is that, like, Grace didn't have to be a woman. It was just fucking awesome that she was a woman because all of the mm. things about her that were female um, spoke to me. Yeah. Whereas if she had been a man, she would still speak to me because I've grown up having to identify with male right. characters. Right, you have that capability of identifying across. But it's like better. Identity. But it's also interesting that you're like a real badass, like 250 fights, and you felt like this character expressed something about you, I would think. Because it's a point of identification. Yeah, probably. But in the ways that I'm excited right now. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, there's no, like, it was because of this. Like, when you identify with something, it's, I think, kind of hidden. Yeah, I just, I kind of, like, from the outside, I'm like, oh, well, I would love to know those hidden things. Like, you you loved how her body was portrayed. Yeah. As functional. Yeah. Right? Like, this is something that you've said, even though you have, like, a fucking rocking body, you're like... It's functional. It's fucking built to do something. Yeah. The muscles all came because I'm training to do something. Not a Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> Inside joke. Inside joke. But... So there was something about her portrayal as a very functional... It's almost like she was a T-2000 herself. Like, look, she literally is cyborg, a cyborg. Like, she has mechanical parts. But the functionality of her drive had this weird robotic humanity yeah. to her. And then, why did her size speak to you so much? Like, you're well, small. You, yeah, I don't, I don't know. There was something. You fucking love her size. Because it's the same thing of Arnie being fucking enormous as the Terminator. Mm. As the Terminator. It's like, if you go back and read that Eight Limbs article I wrote about Bev Francis oh, yeah. and women bodybuilders. Yeah. It's like, why do women want to do bodybuilding? Like, their motivations must be different from men's. And it's like, no, they're not. It's because power feels like power. Mm. So, like, a big woman who's like, because they use such a tiny actress who she's protecting. <laughs> yeah, totally. The, like, you're like, God, she's so big, is like, when you look at Arnie and you're like, God, he's so big. It's yeah. the same excitement but like well, how are you true. going to defeat that like that's, that's very true that's a, a lot to deal with <laughs> you got very excited at, oh when she was uh fighting with that chain yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <You're> like... <laughs> she's got scars and stuff she's cool what about stars what she's scars oh yeah oh yeah scars. her weird surgery scars I'm very scarred, yeah. yeah her scars were just really cool and beautiful like yeah. almost like scarification yeah. in a way weird way Okay, that was pretty good. We, so this is the end of this Muay Thai Bones podcast. <laughs> this has been our film review. <laughs> it, totally. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can, as a patron, get it as a podcast for iTunes 
or whatever they're calling it, Apple Podcasts now, or other Android subscription services. Even a $1 patron, you get access to the full Muay Thai Bones podcast uh, history audio library. So there's tons to listen to. Um, and if you are listening to this on podcast form, thank you for being a patron and uh, being awesome in supporting this kind of unique conversations, conversation space, like three hours just spinning out all the ways that Muay Thai touch our lives and potentially everyone's life. Um, we're kind of like excited by this like crazy format. Um, it's just me talking now. Yeah, <laughs> there's nothing like this except this and then I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see where this can go. Like, the, as we say, these are always conversations that we um, have, anyways, and we're just sharing them. The, oh, we're doing a, another toll. Um, so, thank you to our sponsors. Low Blow and Onyx MMA are official sponsors of Sylvia as a Fighter. Um, if you want to become a sponsor, just contact us. Um, there's a lot of good things that come from supporting Sylvie. And uh, and you make all of it possible. With everyone. Everything that we do. Totally. <laughs> all my and, patrons as well. Yeah. So uh, signing off. Cue music. Dun, 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 dun. Sylvie likes the dun, 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 Terminator dun, dun. music. <laughs> 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 it's actually a jazz. <laughs>